I didn't okay. know you needed an answer. Oh no, I didn't. You look like you were having trouble hearing. That was all. No, no. Um, yeah, and I my email address is the one from whence the invitation came. So just ping me if you get booted and we'll do what we can to get you back in. There's a title, from whence the invitation came. <laughs> Yes. Mayhap, if you should get booted, shouldst thou get booted from- Perchance. <laughs> Perchance. I got my Christmas lights all on. Festive. We're good to go. 
See Dr. Waters has his Christmas tree in the background. <laughs> Susie has her Christmas plant. Aaron has the traditional Christmas curtain. Oh, you draw, you put on your Christmas coat. I, I, you, dressed you dressed for this meeting. I, I dressed. Aaron's, Aaron's just playing a loop. Have you seen those YouTube videos where they just take a picture and just run the loop? All right, so we are live. You are ready to begin, Mayor. All right. Then I'm gonna go ahead and call this meeting to order. Welcome to the December 8th, 2000, or 2020 City Council Study Session. Uh, let's go ahead and start with roll call, please. Mayor Bagley. I would be present. <laughs> Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Adago Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Here. And Council Member Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. Then let's go ahead and start with the pledge. I'll lead us off on the count of three, or just actually approximately three. Here we go. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the to the flag of the United States, States of America, America. And, to and to the republic, to the republic for which, which, stands, which it stands, one nation, under God, 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 and justice for all. And justice, and liberty, for all. And justice for all. I think we, every week, I wonder if we got it right, but I thought that counts. All right, then let's go on to, uh, computer froze there for a second. All right, any motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items? Dr. Waters, actually, I believe that you asked for a moment here, so go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley, for remembering that I asked for a moment. I'm, this is not a motion to direct staff. Uh, but tomorrow is the 80th birthday of one of our senior uh, elder leaders in Longmont, John Shetter, uh, who came, arrived in Longmont in 1971 with his bride, his bride Bev, uh, and spent 50 years, or 50 years, spent his career in the banking business and both while employed and post-employment, served on the hospital board, the YMCA board. He's a friend of the senior center. He's a, he's a storyteller volunteer in the school district. He is the epitome of a servant leader. And so for John's 80th birthday tomorrow, I wanna to offer a birthday limerick. John, John Shetter, we all know is real smart. For Longmont, he has shirt on his part. On his birth, on, so on this birthday, we just want to say we love him for the size of his heart. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. No, th thank you. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Christensen. I, thanks for that limerick. I think that was a very nice way to greet him for his birthday. Um, it has occurred to me, we had the, uh, the Arapaho, Northern Arapaho came down and only two members of city council were able to actually be there and the rest of us really couldn't hear what was going on. But we have $67,000 in uh, the council contingency fund. And given how, um, how devastating COVID has been, to particularly to uh, First Nations people, I think it would be appropriate if uh, our staff reached out to the Northern Arapaho to ask them if it would be helpful to them to have say a $5,000 donation to their hospital or some other um, thing that would be helpful for them in this time. I, mean, oh, I, I would like to- uh, I love that idea. Okay. Is that a motion? Yeah, I guess it's a motion to direct staff to do that. I'll second it. All right, it's been moved and seconded by, it's been moved by Councilmember Christensen, second amendment, seconded by Councilmember Peck to have staff reach out to, uh, uh, to the leaders, I presume Lee Spoon Hunter uh, of the Northern Arapaho tribe and discuss with them their, their needs such as maybe a monetary donation to their hospital. Um, and the, the amount of $5,000 was suggested. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. And Harold, I've got some contact info if your people need it, okay? All right, anybody else? All right, great. Let's move on then to the COVID-19 update. You're muted, Harold. 
There's a little microphone on the bottom of your screen, left-hand corner, Harold. <laughs> if you click it, the little red line will go away. Okay. No, I, I was throwing because I didn't know. Normally we do public and buy to be heard first on this, but. You're right. We do have public. That's a nice way of saying, Mayor, get your, get your stuff together. I was like, wow, this seems to be going fairly fast. Thank you, Marsha. All right, let's go ahead and start with public invited to be heard. Then we'll do the COVID update. How many are on the list? We haven't opened it. Let's open. We it. haven't opened it yet. <laughs> right, let's take, let's take, let's just take a three minute break then and let people get online. Okay. We'll be back in three. Thank you, Harold and Marsha. <laughs> You're welcome.
All right, just a reminder to our callers that uh, if you are joining us for our public invited to be heard, please remember to mute your live stream and listen for the instructions on your telephone. Uh, I will call you by the last three digits of your telephone number, and then you will be able to state your name and address for the record, and you will have three minutes. So I'm sure we'll get started here in just a few minutes. Just remember to mute your live stream and listen to the instructions on your telephone. All right, how many we got? Mayor, looks like we have three callers with us. All right, so just so you guys know, heads up, for some reason, these funky colored lights that you're seeing in the background that I thought would be so cool for Christmas for, for council, apparently they're on my Wi-Fi and I put them all over my house and it's competing with my computer. So if, if you lose me, it's because my lights are stealing my cable connection. So if I disappear momentarily, Aaron, just, I'll be back. All right, um, I know that because our TVs are not going out. All right, uh, Harold, let's go ahead and hold off on you still and start with first call public invited to be heard. I'll take the time, you can start calling him in. Excellent, so guest ending in 488, you should be able to unmute yourself, state your name and address for the record and you have three minutes. Is my microphone easier to hear? Ooh, no. that's easier, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Guest 488. Okay, hello, uh, City Council. My name is Scott Cunningham, and I reside at 3771 South Narcissus Way in Denver. As you remember, I'm a practicing internal medicine, integrative internal medicine physician, and I've spoken to this council several times uh, detailing the adverse health effects of wireless smart meters but this evening, I'd like to focus your attention on a safety issue which often carries much more immediate risk. I'm talking about the risk of electronic smart meters, such as the proposed AMI meter, catching fire. Now, I'll be the first to admit I don't have an electrical engineering background as Ms. Martin does, but... I'd like to share my understanding of this issue, essentially from an educated layperson's perspective. My goal is to make a very complex subject understandable to all of us. I'd like to introduce you to Fire Chief Dwayne Roddy, who testified to the Michigan House Energy Committee in 2017 that he watched a smart meter installed 36 hours earlier on his own house ignite an arc at his home from a power surge. For reasons I'll explain, the, the electricity kept flowing and arcing, um, uh, melting the lines to his house and didn't stop until the transformer on the pole blew and then the fuse on the pole, on the pole finally tripped. Fortunately, since he was physically at home at the time, he was able to intervene and prevent his home from burning potentially to the ground. Here's the inside scoop on how this smart meter fire actually started. As Chief Roddy explains, the standard time-tested analog electricity meters have very effective surge protection so that in the 14 years that he had served the department, he had never witnessed an analog meter fire. In contrast, Electronic smart meters, such as the, the proposed AMI meter, have very weak surge protection, and when they blow, since they're installed on the outside of the house, there's no circuit breaker to stop the flow of electricity, so it continues to flow, feeding the fire. 
if an overage comes from the power line, for the power line, the building circuit breakers can't stop the flow of power because the circuit breakers inside the building can only protect from excessive power flow inside the building. So how would Fire Chief Dwayne Roddy advise you to proceed? I believe Fire Chief Roddy's message to you would be something like this. Don't even think about installing electronic smart meters on the outside of residences and businesses. Any assurances of safety will surely ring hollow when those meters inevitably begin to fail. And when the investigations start, I'm sure that you wouldn't want people to find your name on the work order. I recommend you to proceed with extreme caution, taking the time necessary to provide the citizens of Longmont a metering system that meets sustainability needs without excessive risk of fire. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, next. All right. Guest ending in 499. 499, you should be able to unmute yourself, state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Uh, okay. This is Doe Kelly of Barberry Drive in Longmont, and um, I have some bullet points which represent a summary of the many points that have been raised to do with the proposed smart meter rollout throughout some of the uh, Longmont City Council public invited to be heard meetings. So starting with number one, smart meters, AKA AMI, receive and transmit information via microwave radiation at 2.45 gigahertz frequency. Number two, contrary to Bill Hayes, environmental engineer with Boulder County Public Health Statements, there is considerable published science on biological harms from non-ionizing microwave radiation such as that emitted by smart meters, cell phones, cell towers, 3G, 4G, and fifth generation wireless, also known as 5G. Number three, contrary to AMI expert Rick Schmidt's assessment, there is ample recorded evidence of smart meter fire hazards. Number four, Susan Foster of Lyons documents, firefighters in California spent 15 years and millions of dollars fighting cell towers on their stations, having suffered harm and impairment, living and working in the presence of cell towers emitting non-ionizing microwave radiation. Number five. Susan Foster, a medical writer, initiated and assisted the medical quantifying of this impairment suffered by this specific population of people. Legal struggles around cell sightings on fire stations in California continue. Number six, Virginia Farber of Fort Collins recounts a cancer cluster at San Diego State University arising in a single dorm room from a cell tower adjacent to the dorm caused the death by brain cancer to her son, Rich, and several other unlucky victims. Number seven, Virginia Farver of Fort Collins was forced by police presence and in spite of her strong objections to have a smart meter installed on her home against her will. Number eight, a Pennsylvania court recently ruled it illegal to force residents to have smart meters installed on their homes, setting a potential legal precedent countrywide. Number nine, Longmont stands to be sued in court as health and safety issues arise with AMI as no insurance carrier will insure smart meters for liability. Number 10, smart meters and unfettered exposure to non-ionizing radiation clearly do more harm than good and it's it's the new asbestos. Do we, the people of Longmont, really want to spend $16 million on technology that's nearly obsolete, according to Tim Sheckley, and may shortly become an albatross around our collective neck? Where's the precautionary principle in all of this? And whatever happened to common sense? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Last caller. All right, Mayor, it looks like the last caller may have hung up. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the update on COVID-19 by Harold Dominguez. Mayor, um, Council, we actually have Jeff Zayak from Boulder County Health here tonight to, to present uh, on the uh, COVID. 
So Jeff's on the screen now, and um, Erica, can you get his presentation ready? Or I'll let Jeff call it up when he's ready, sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Harold. Thanks, council members. It's a pleasure to be back. What I plan to do is just walk you through the latest data that we have today, which is um, so far looking good. It's, it's a positive report, and we'll see what happens in the next few days. Um, and then just talk about what we might expect over the next few days, as well as uh, what we might expect working into the, the winter holidays. Next slide, please. So this is the current incidence rate on the state public health dial. Um, and it's the incidence rate uh, per 100,000 for a two week period. And Boulder County as at 644.9. This was as of this morning, it gets updated twice daily. So if you went on there now, you'd probably see a different rate. Our rate has been decreasing for the last week, which is positive news. Um, uh, but again, we'll wait to see what happens throughout this next week. The next indicator is on the next slide. And this is our positivity rate. Um, and our, our current positivity rate in Boulder County is 6.7%. Um, and this is largely because of the significant amount of testing that we have in Boulder County per capita. We have a large amount of testing that's occurring. I'll show you that on a slide as we move forward. Um, but this, this indicator is in the yellow. Next, next and last indicator on the state dial is the current number of days of e decreasing or stable hospitalizations. Currently, we are in the yellow, and this is declining in a positive trend, as I'll show you when we look at our specific data. Next slide. So this is a, a very busy graph, but uh, what I, this is the graph that we typically share with you. It's the Metro Denny, Denver County um, COVID-19 new case rates, and it's a seven-day moving average. And you can see that right now, um, Boulder County is actually got the lowest um, case rate uh, among all the metro areas. Um, and we are the second lowest in the total number of new cases that we're seeing as well. This only shows the rate, um, but if I showed you the graph on, this, on the number of new cases, we have the second lowest number of new cases across the metro. Again, all these are fairly positive trends. Most of these rates are decreasing. We have one in Denver um, that's slightly increasing as well as Arapahoe County that's slightly increasing. Next slide. This is the total number of positives and then the total number of positives associated with long-term care facilities. Uh, as you probably all remember early on in the outbreak of this disease, our biggest challenges with deaths, and they still are uh, to this day, have been in long-term care facilities. And that's because long-term care facilities are congregate care facilities. Um, and we know that once the disease is in uh, the facility, it's difficult to control the spread of the disease. And obviously it's affecting our most uh, at-risk population, um, which ends up with unfortunately a, a larger um, death rate than our general population. Um, the positive news here is that when we do have vaccine, we already have contracts set up for strike teams to go into each of our long-term care facilities to be able to provide the vaccine. We know that the majority of these cases are coming in from uh, asymptomatic staff that are bringing uh, the virus in still to this day. So, um, so we do have some hope um, and some light at the end of the tunnel here in the next couple months. Next slide, please. This just shows our five-day average new case rate. Um, we're very happy to see it continue to go down. Um, at 128.6, we still don't have capacity, not here in Boulder County, nor at a statewide level, to be able to do the level of contact tracing or case investigation that allows us to get to the majority of these cases. Um, so we, we are contacting um, many of the secondary contacts and probable contacts via letters or electronic um, devices at this point. Uh, and we need to get these case counts and that map, if you remember that first map I showed you is mostly all red across the state. When that map starts to turn back to yellow and green, we will be at a place where at a statewide level, um, we're at a better place to be able to do the case investigations and contact tracing. Next slide. This just shows the, the relative contribution from each of our munis municipalities that have uh, positive tests. You can see that um, back in early September associated primarily with um, the University of Colorado outbreak, the far majority um, we're coming from the city of Boulder uh, that has switched 
Um, and we are seeing the largest majority now uh, from the city of Longmont. And we've seen that for the last, uh, approximately the last month. Next slide. This is another bu busy graph. And what I just wanna call attention to, this is our, our trend in two week incidents among um, Boulder County residents by age group from zero to nine, all the way up to 75 plus. And you can see that um, for the majority of our, our age groups, the, the rate is declining, which is what we wanna see. And we hope to see that big, huge spike right in the middle is associated with the 18 to 22 year old um, spike that happened when the University of Colorado uh, brought kids back late August, early September. And the one that I wanna call attention to is the one you do see increasing there. Uh, that's our 75 plus age group. And again, we know that's associated with the long-term care facilities. Next slide. This shows um, the breakdown of residents testing positive or who are considered probable by race and ethnicity by week. And you can see that one of our biggest challenges here is um, the disparity and inequity that we have in the number of Hispanic Latinx population that currently is positive. Um, and we know that this is an area that we need to continue to focus on. I wanna give a, a thank you to Longmont for working in partnership with us to think about how we can best engage um, this community in decision-making and help us think about the best way to make a difference within that population. Um, so thank you again to Longmont here. Next slide. This is the total number of tests and the total number of tests that are positive. What I just really wanna illustrate here, you probably remember me talking about the number of tests that we need to do per county um, early on in the response. That number was 495 for Boulder County. We're consistently testing um, high numbers well above 495 now. So we have a very adequate testing capacity. We have four different sites uh, in Boulder that are, that are drive up sites. One of those in Longmont, one of those in Boulder, and then our two priority population sites, Netherland and Lyons. Uh, again, want to thank Longmont here for the support around that, that site in Longmont. Um, and all these sites have stayed busy and are providing access to our community uh, in a way that's making testing as easy and free uh, as possible. So we really appreciate the support from, from all of our jurisdictions. Next slide. This is our five-day positivity rate. And this is different than the one that you saw on the dial. The reason we check that we track five days because we can see changes more quickly. So the one on the dial that I showed you was a, a two week positivity rate, but this is a five day and you can see that our positivity rate um, is slowly dropping. Uh, we hope to see that continue. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, what we're expecting to see in the next week or so. Next slide. This is our hospitalizations. This is a very good trend to see obviously. Um, we've been in an increase in hospitalizations since the end of August. Um, that's pretty consistently climbed um, throughout this, this last portion of the disease progression. Uh, and this has been challenging for us because as you can see the disease or in the number, number of hospitalizations for COVID-19 positives is significantly higher than the highest point it was back in the early uh, part of this disease. The good news here is that our hospitals have done a great job of being able to really figure out how to treat people who are in the hospital. So the actual length of stay in hospitals with COVID-19 positive patients now is much less than it was uh, in the early part of this disease outbreak. Um, so that's a good thing. Our hospitals are telling us that their biggest challenge right now is in fact around uh, 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 staffing of beds they're, the staffing that they have in their facilities, their staff are pretty burned out and um, are much more, uh, have much higher turnover rate than they did early on in this disease. And I wanna give a shout out here to anybody who's listening to say that, um, please take time to, to thank healthcare workers. They're, they put themselves out there every single day uh, to treat these folks who show up in the hospital that are coming in from our community and do the best they can to care for them. Um, and they don't get the same level of appreciation that they did early on in this. You remember the howls that people were doing at eight o'clock. That doesn't happen as much anymore. So please do a shout out um, for our healthcare workers who are still doing their very best 
to keep up with this with this challenge. Next slide. Uh, this is the hospital surge metrics that the state is tracking. The biggest thing I want to make note of here is that we that we don't have any. We're not approaching surge uh, crisis, especially for our medical beds. What we are challenged with is, uh, sorry, I have a screen popping up on me. Um, what we are challenged with uh, is our is our ability again to make sure that hospitals have the staffing they need to be able to take care of the beds uh, that they do need uh, to be able to treat patients. And I'll just use one more example. So early on in the in the uh, outbreak, when we had hospitals that were running into issues, they were having to, to cancel elective surgeries, reschedule them. Um, and they're not having to do that at this point because they haven't reached that surge capacity yet. And again, the biggest issue is not necessarily the ICU availability uh, or vent availability, but it's, it's actually the ability to staff those beds in our hospitals. Next slide. This is the state hospitalization. And as you can see, um, we've got a decline there, positive trend. Next slide. This is the number of deaths. Unfortunately, um, uh, what we've had is we've had 35 deaths in November um, and 14 deaths already in December. And this is a similar trend to what we saw early on when we saw increasing cases by uh, getting into long-term care facilities. We know that that resulted in increased deaths. We know that by the by and far, our, or the large per, largest percentage of our deaths are different, definitely in our long-term care facility. And that's what you see on, in the orange on this graph right here. It's not because those facilities haven't figured out all the prevention strategies to take. They're actually in really good places. It is um, that asymptomatic folks are bringing the disease in and not every facility can test every single person every single day. So our greatest hope right now uh, is to get this vaccine out there and get it in people's hands to start providing it uh, to staff and people in the facilities. Next slide. This is just a graph of flu versus COVID versus hospitalizations. Really quickly, the green line is just hospitalizations that are non-COVID. So what we have um, right now in the hospitals is we have a lot more people that are hospitalized for non-COVID reasons. So as we increase COVID, um, hospitalizations to that. And then if we were to inc increase flu with that, then it's gonna put a stress again on that staffing shortage and on the beds that are available. Luckily, the blue line on the bottom that you see is flu. We have not seen uh, many flu cases show up yet. And I wanna thank everybody who, who took the extra effort to make sure that they got their flu shot this year because that is gonna help the hospitals and help our healthcare systems. Next slide. This is, and I'm getting close to the end here. Um, this is the social distancing uh, that you've heard me talk about before. And Boulder County right now is at 54% social distancing. When we were, um, again, you can see it's compared to 86% in April when we had the stay at home orders in place. So we're fairly, uh, a fairly large percentage lower than we were before. And we know that eventually um, the lower that we are in social distancing, the more we know that cases will increase. And I'll illustrate that. I think it's in the next graph here. Next slide. Actually in the next one after that, but um, what this, you can go back, it's okay. Go back one more. This just shows um, the stay at home index. Um, and it's what the graph on the left shows is historically where we were in 2019, the amount of time that people stayed at home versus where we are right now on the right hand side. So you can say, see that early on April, May of this year, very high levels of people who were staying at home that has dropped throughout the year. Um, to the point where uh, our lowest point was around October. We're now starting to bring that number back up slowly. We know that this is really difficult for people right now. It's really hard to not be socializing. It's really hard to stay at home. And we know that people have COVID fatigue and it's also critically important um, to controlling the spread of the disease. This next slide, I'll be able to talk about those projections. So this shows lapses in control. This is statewide. Um, current transmission control, um, which is what the TC is. Um, and that's just another term for social distancing. Um, if that stayed consistent right now um, with 71%, you see the black line that turns into the blue line on both those graphs. That is, that is what our projections would look like going into Mar the end of March, basically. 
uh, if everything stays the same as it is right now. If we lapse between 10, 20, or 30 percent, you can see how those things spike up. So on the on the left hand side, you can see that we're likely not going to exceed our hospital total hospitalization surge platform. But what we may exceed is um, active ICU patients and the ability to deal with those ICU patients, depending on how much um, we lapse in that social distancing. So we want to be diligent and maintain this social distancing as we move forward, especially over the winter holiday. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then Harold had asked for just a summary of what does it look like in terms of complaints and enforcement relative to Longmont. Uh, Longmont, I really appreciate your support and coordination. Um, we have not had any major issues in Longmont. These are numbers for the last two weeks. If a, if a uh, jurisdiction doesn't show up, it's because they didn't have any reported complaints in that period of time. The primary complaints in Longmont have been focused on masking um, in the last two weeks and just um, the lack of masking in different businesses across Longmont. And again, I just wanna say again, how much I appreciate the partnership um, with each of our municipalities because the partnership is what is making the difference and keeping us focused the way that we are. And I think this is the last slide. Yep. So just to summarize, we still have an estimated one in 40 people statewide. This was, this prediction was as of this Saturday. They'll update this prediction again at the end of this week. But we still have one in 40 people statewide who are infectious with COVID-19. That means that we have a lot of COVID in our communities. Our infection rates earlier on in this, so if you think back three months ago, um, end of spring, early part of summer, we were probably around one in 800. So we have a significant amount of virus in our community, which means that we have a lot higher risk of running into somebody who is infectious with the disease. We know that there's still, um, we don't know exactly what the percentage of people who are asymptomatic are, um, but we know we have asymptomatic spread occurring um, throughout our community. Uh, and we have a high probability that we are gonna run into somebody that has the disease when we are with more than 40 people. About 16.5% of our population so far has been infected with COVID as far as uh, the Colorado School of Public Health can tell. What we're waiting on is we know based on Thanksgiving, we're expecting to see some more increases in those graphs that I showed you. Um, we probably will see those today, tomorrow, the next day through this week we will be able to have a much better sense of what those look, what, what anything that had to do with Thanksgiving will actually look like. That will generate new modeling, which will help us predict um, where those cases may come down uh, in the future. When, when you're thinking about that springtime, you saw that um, really February, March is when you started to see hospitalizations come down. The reason that modeling is so important is because it has an impact on schools. It has an impact on businesses. Um, so if we can knock the numbers down and we don't see as much of a surge from Thanksgiving, that, pr that uh, provides us with a better picture moving forward. And if we see a significant surge, obviously it, it, it lengthens that projection out, which makes it harder for all of us. So we need people to be diligent. The School of Public Health will run some new modeling at the end of this week. Um, so we'll have some updates. We'll share that with our municipal uh, folks across the county and uh, we'll be able to, to have some more conversations around what does that really mean for our schools as we move forward. And finally, there is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we do have some hope with the vaccine. The vaccine has a high effectiveness, which is very, um, which is very encouraging. Uh, there was concerns about if the vaccine would be that effective when the trials first started um, and the numbers that we're seeing are very positive. The state is receiving their first doses next week. Um, all regions will get some of the vaccine, but 47,000 initial doses for over 3,000 healthcare workers or 300,000 healthcare workers who were in the first priority obviously uh, won't make a big dent. But each week, uh, the state expects to get another shipment uh, until we are done with all the priorities, um, which is roughly. Uh, roughly the middle of uh, the middle of you know June-ish time frame. It could be sooner than that, 
It could be later than that. It just depends on if the vaccine gets delayed, if there's any other issues associated with it. Um, but by the time we are through <sighs> the summertime, we should be through um, all of the priority populations all the way down to the lowest priority across the entire state. Uh, and that's it. I know that's a lot of information. So thank you for bearing with me. I'll stop there and see if there's questions. Councilor Christensen, sorry about that. My mouse was. Okay. Um, Mr. Zayak, um, when it says 16.5% uh, of the population of Colorado infected, uh, I'm, I wasn't clear whether that means that so far that is the percentage of the population that have been infected, or is that the amount uh, that is currently affected? Infected, I'm sorry. That is, the, that is the total percentage of the population that they're estimating has been infected at this point. Thank you. Dr. Waters. Yeah, it's not for Jeff, it's for Harold. Um, I'm still gonna, I'm gonna remain curious about, uh, we have any data from the wastewater testing and when would we, when would we anticipate if we don't have it and, and, and uh, how can we put it to use, right, as we, anticipate what's coming. So um, I'm going to, if, if Jeff has time, I'm going to go ahead and ask Dale to jump in because we've been connected with Jeff's staff and then they connected us with the state um, group today and we had a conversation earlier about our model and what we've built. And so um, Dale's going to talk generally today about where we are um, in our conversation in the near future. The um, state is um, hoping to have a, a public dashboard with that data that'll, that'll, bring, that'll bring that forward. And so today, Dale will tell you what we're seeing um, and it may help Jeff in terms of what Longmont's gonna look like. Um, and then we'll start seeing the data hopefully in the very near future when the state makes it public. Dale, do you wanna jump in? Sure, um, if, if now's a good time. Um, sure. Mayor Bagley and members of council, uh, Dale Rademacher, deputy city manager, um, Council, as you know, we have uh, now for several months, um, going back to um, May, been uh, participating in a collaborative effort with uh, several other communities up and down the Front Range, um, all being coordinated through Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment uh, and Colorado State University. And um, Longmont has recently also um, sort of uh, increased the sampling frequency uh, here at, at Longmont. Um, the program uh, we refer to as our wastewater surveillance program. Essentially what we're doing is we're testing uh, the wastewater as it uh, uh, comes into the wastewater treatment plant for the presence of, of the uh, COVID virus and, um, and sampling that and, and, and getting that data on, now on a daily basis. Uh, we were doing it just weekly um, but we have now upped the uh, sampling frequency to, to, uh, to a daily frequency. We have also been working, I got to give a lot of credit to uh, uh, Roberto uh, Luna and, and uh, Casey Campo and our staff who have uh, began the analysis of the data. And, and what we are working to do is to understand that relationship of the uh, loadings that we're seeing of the virus in wastewater uh, versus the case counts. And we're comparing to the five day average of new cases in Longmont. And so um, a great partnership again with Boulder County Health, they are providing us with the, um, the new cases that are, that are being determined um, in Longmont. And so we're, we're charting that and, and analyzing that data. What we are doing and, and what the data is beginning to show us is that it does give us a fairly good indicator with about a seven day uh, lead, if you will. In other words, um, a sample taken today will give us some indication 
of the number of cases that we may anticipate in Longmont a week from now. And uh, what I can report is that, well, first of all, folks, this is, <clears throat> this is sort of like raw data and research um, live. And so it, it, it has not had uh, anything near uh, peer review or you know, substantial um, verification. We are, as Harold mentioned, though, working with um, staff at Boulder County Health and the city of Boulder. Um, and today we also met with um, folks from Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, our initial feedback from all the agencies has been um, what we're doing here in Longmont uh, appears to make a lot of sense. Um, everybody is fairly impressed with um, the, um, the correlation of the data. Um, and again, by the data, I mean the number of, of virus load count in wastewater versus new cases. Um, what I can tell you is that we are coordinating with the state. And as Harold mentioned, they, they are intending to release the dashboard. I, we anticipated that in the, in the next couple of weeks. I would anticipate us then following that up with a Longmont uh, local information because um, we are reaching a point where sharing this information, certainly with Boulder County Health, which we're doing and have been doing for some time, um, is proven to be um, probably helpful in, in trying to make decisions and to anticipate uh, what might be coming at us a week from now. Um, the good news that I can tell you is that we are not seeing a surge from Thanksgiving at this point. And we're about mm, 10 to 12 days out from Thanksgiving. And so as Jeff was saying, we're looking closely uh, at the next several days this week um, and uh, to see whether or not there's any spike in loadings. And so I think um, if there's any message from, from this research, it's um, everybody needs to stay the, uh, stay the course. We need to all continue to do what we're doing. Um, it does appear to be having some beneficial impact. And it is, you know, certainly not the time to uh, let up on our, uh, on our uh, uh, commitment to protecting ourselves and each other. So um, with that, that's the general update. We, we will at some point, uh, Council Member Waters, uh, be in a better position to, to show some of the, some of the uh, uh, charts and data. We're a bit reluctant to do that right now because again, we're coordinating with our partners on the overall collaborative, but um, suffice it to say, we are seeing a good correlation and it is um, at this point, knock on wood, trending downward. And I think the piece to that, if I can add something to that really quick. So when you look at it, you know, we talked about what we heard and they said the eyeball test, it looks good. The R squared is 0.7. So those things really work. Um, Longmont's a little bit different. And I think this is the challenge in this data um, because we don't have the industrial base that other communities have. It, it's easier to really get a hold of that data in terms of what it means for the community versus other communities that may have more industrial waste going into the system. Um, to Jeff's point that he said, and this is why I said he may want to hear this and I wanted to jump in. What I took away from this data is when I saw his graph in terms of mobility, when he sent it to me before the meeting and I compare it to the loading, and then I see the direction that the cases are moving, it's all starting to line up. But like Jeff, I wanna see what happens in the next few days to really take it through the last sort of look at this. Um, but what's very clear is the advice they're giving when we're seeing people do it. We're seeing it in case counts, we're seeing it in the wastewater loading. And I think it's important to really be focused on, on the advice and how we're moving forward. Um, and what I said is I want to, I hope we can move through this even faster. So we get to the point where I can call Jeff and go, here's what we're seeing on the loading. We need to really hammer our communities to say we need to be diligent again because it's going to show it to us hopefully ahead of time versus waiting on the case counts. And so let us get through this week. And then I think we'll be really at the point where we're more comfortable. 
I just follow up, Harold. You just said you said when they when they do it. Um, I think what I what I'm going to interpret is when when residents comply with the three W's, right? Wash your hands, watch your distance, wear your mask. When we do that, that's when you're seeing the corresponding. Yeah, the socially distance and the piece of all of that because we're finding that's that's the, the piece of this, um, and I, it's nothing new. Um, Jeff's been saying this. But you can see that mobility start making its way into different data sets. Sorry, sorry, Council Member Ferry, I just wanted to throw that in there. You called me, right? Yeah. Okay, I can hear you. So I have a couple of questions. Um, one, and it's in regard to testing. So when we look at the disparities among the Hispanic and Latinx community, um, in case of positivity, you know, the positivity rate, um, how often are people, are you looking at the demographics of people who are being tested? I know for, for me, I can opt to not put my ethnicity in there. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, you can decide whether or not to. So I understand that it might be a little difficult to keep track, but I'm wondering as far as, um, and this one can kind of go to Harold as well, um, what, one, what are we doing to help educate the Latinx community to get tested? Um, I go every other week, we go as part, it's part of our district where we have two tests a month. So encouraging folks to go in and get tested regularly and then for Jeff, do we have, um, are, is there any data being collected on um, how, how many in the Latinx community are getting tested? Harold, do you wanna go first? I'll let you go first and then I'll jump in. Okay, um, so we are collecting data. Uh, as long as people are disclosing it, we're collecting data. Mm -hmm. We have done, I think as you're aware, some pop-up testing as well. So we've gone to specific communities, really tried to outreach to people. We've been using our cultural brokers. Harold can talk about the partnership that we have with Longmont and all the work that we're doing together. Um, but obviously the, we need to be able to engage our Latinx community as decision makers in this. And, and we need to work with them to figure out what's the best way to really reach the community, provide the community with supports, have them be part of the solution with us um, in order for us to be successful. And clearly um, from that data that, that I showed you on that graph, we're not there yet. We still have work to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I'll just, yeah, go ahead. So um, we've had a couple of pop-up testing. One was um, near the mobile home park uh, near Quo campus. And um, that went relatively well. I think we had 200 or so tests in there. And so that one worked really well. Based on where we were seeing the, they've given me access to the hotspot map throughout the community. And so we tried for a couple of weeks for a pop-up testing on Tuesdays at Lashley Street Station. Mm -hmm. um, that one didn't perform as well. And so what we, we looked at doing is really um, anchoring back on the fairgrounds testing Mm -hmm. um, but then retooling, and this is the work that Marika and she's working with Carmen Neighborhood Services and Cultural Brokers, mm -hmm. really retooling how we're communicating within neighborhoods within our community to, to encourage that testing. And that's one where we probably will reach out to council to try to help us get that message out into uh, deeper into our neighborhoods within our community because we're finding that is it is an issue to deal with. What we've also learned, and, and I'm gonna say this is a, probably a equally an economic demographic issue as it is um, um, ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So when I was there and, and what we've heard is I think questions, is the testing free? But then when you get into it, it's, um, so what happens if I test positive? Mm -hmm. um, how do I pay my rent? How do I have utility bills? How do I take care of my family? And so we're trying to really work on getting that information out because mm -hmm. my gut's telling me that 
there is anxiety with getting tested if you know that you can't go in and work and then you can't take care of your family. So that, that's another layer that we've started talking about in terms of how we really communicate what resources are available to people so we can provide assistance if they're in that situation. And, and I know that's, that's something that comes up a lot. So we're really trying to refocus our efforts and, and how we engage with neighborhoods. And um, to a certain extent, we've even talked about, you know, walking through and putting our care package, cat, care packages, you know, on doors and things based on where we're seeing it in terms of that direct communication. Yeah. Um, and so, and you know, I do have a question. So that were there times that the Lashley Center closed early? Because I heard on two separate occasions that they people went out there and there was nobody around. So, so uh, everything, uh, everything was closed. So what I can say, the I was there the first week and um, we closed a line early, but we didn't close it early. Okay. Um, and we still had people out there cleaning up after the, the end time was there. So I know from my perspective, when I was there the first Tuesday, they didn't. Uh -huh. um, and I can double check on the second one, but I don't think they did either then. So, And so, you know, one of the folks, because I talked to them in person, well, you know, I just said, well, if there's nobody, you know, maybe the facility's open, but if there are no, if there aren't anybody going in to get tested, you know, you wouldn't see a lot of people. So, you know, maybe they were there, but, you know, did you circle around or I, I don't know, but if, Karen, I see you up. So, uh, Harold and members of council, I do believe that Carmen indicated that, that, um, that last night of testing that they did they did close down earlier than what they advertised because they did not have anyone there um, to get tested. So um, I can tell you the exact time, but as she did mention that they closed a bit early than what okay. they had anticipated. Okay. Joan, your, your hand was up. No? All right, Councilmember Christensen. Um, Harold, I, I'm also concerned because I've, I've heard from uh, a member of the Latino community that um, well, and I also know my own personal experience. A lot of people are just worried about money because uh, when my son and I went out to Clinica, um, the shot was free, but the administering of the shot was not free. So we wound up paying $150 for my son's shot. And I wound up paying, I don't know, some amount for my shot. So I think that a lot of low-income people are very worried about um, how much they're going to pay. And a lot of uh, Latino families are a little larger and have extended families. So the whole family, maybe 10 people, they're going in and they're worried that they can't, you know, they'll get a shot and then they'll get a big bill for something. So I, I think it would be really important to let people know the reality of how much they're actually going to be charged because I think that's a lot of the reason that a lot of people are not going in to, to get tested. Is this the flu shot that you're talking about? I'm sorry. I said shot. I meant, I meant COVID test. Okay. Yeah. Administering the test costs money, um, even though the, the test is free. That's what the nurse told me. So I'm just saying Steph, what the term, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, um, go ahead. So, and if you if you go to our website, um, if you just search Boulder County COVID-19, click on the testing link, it'll tell you which sites have an administrative fee and which don't. But if you go to the fairgrounds as an example, or um, the Boulder Stasio Field drive up site, completely free, no cost whatsoever. So anybody who's listening can go to either of those two sites, um, completely free of cost. There are some, if you go to individual providers or to a hospital that do charge an administrative fee, but all of that is on our website and associated with each of those facilities. This was Clinica in Lafayette and uh, I, I was led to believe that it was all free, but anyway. Harold, you're-, you're Yeah, moved. yeah. Marika is also part of the, the GIS um, and working in partnership with um, 
Boulder County Health. And so we'll make sure we push this in and then we'll work with them to get that information out locally in terms of where and, and, and making sure that uh, it's also translated as we get it out in the community. You're muted too. I don't know what it is. I swear I unmute this thing and it just goes back to mute. So there we go. Okay. So the, uh, so anyone else have any other questions before I ask my question? Okay. So I've taken a lot of heat for the last couple of weeks, or not anymore, but last week I took a lot of heat um, for encouraging Weld County and businesses to, to back up the governor. Um, one concern that I'm hearing from neighboring mayors is that there's going to be a 4,000 member mega church meeting up in Lafayette. And so um, uh, they're frustrated that the, the, the Boulder County uh, Health Department's not doing anything to stop that. I don't know if you can, um, but, and, and nor would I advocate that you necessarily do it, but a lot of the frustration continues to be over the seemingly, um, a lot of our small, small businesses, especially the restaurants are hurting more and more closing down. They can't hold on much longer. Yeah. Uh, part of my being vocal to Weld County was that we're doing our part. The sooner they do their part, the quicker we all get out of this, but we're doing things as a county, such as that 4,000 member meeting of people coming in. And I'm just, I, I have, I'm a, I sometimes have a hard time defending some of our, our, what seems to be government decisions. What are your thoughts? How much longer can I, I'm not advocating that you shut down this, this church group. I'm advocating that we open up restaurants and, and figure out another way because people just are dropping left and right restaurants, businesses, they, they're, they're shutting down for good. So how do we, A, keep the COVID numbers trending downward while starting to think about providing some relief for our small businesses? Is that, are they, are they mutually ex exclusive of one another or not? Not necessarily. And thank you, Mayor Bagley, for asking that question and for the advocacy that you've done. You, you've been really clear that this needs to, that we need to follow these suggestions and that when we work together, we're gonna to be more successful. So I greatly appreciated that. And I know you've you've taken heat over that. Um, and what really drives, and, and I, I think everybody on this call knows and every presentation that I've been doing, I've been talking about, nobody wants to have anything shut down. Um, and it is, it's extremely unfortunate because we're, we're losing businesses that may never ever be able to open up again. We're putting people into homelessness that currently weren't in homelessness. Um, and this is completely preventable. We know that. Um, so the message for sure that I wanna get across is that if people follow those recommendations, we don't need to have any of these policies in place. We know that the behavior change will result in the positive trends that we need. We know for sure that face masks can make a significant difference. So even in the absence of more restrictive policy, wearing a face mask makes a significant difference. I hope we can all take that to heart because the policies aren't necessary unless we ignore the prevention strategies. And I don't certainly don't wanna be doing that. I know you certainly don't wanna be doing that. Um, and it puts us in a, in a no-win situation. Um, in terms of the churches, the, I, I would bet that everybody's been paying attention to some of the things that are happening at, nas at the national level of churches. And the churches were recently reclassified as essential businesses by Colorado in their latest public health order, which means they can operate like any other essential business. They can have indoor or outdoor gatherings. They have to maintain six feet. They have to wear masks indoors, but there's no limitation on them that's different from any other essential business at this point. And that's a huge challenge for all of us. Um, for me, it's a huge challenge. For you, it's a huge challenge. For every community around us, it's a huge challenge. The message I would send to anybody listening to this is, if you're going to go to a church gathering, I urge you and implore you to please wear a mask, maintain distance. It's, it's safer to maintain more than six feet between family groups than it is just six feet. But if you're gonna do that, please maintain the social distancing and wear a mask. It will make a difference. We are, uh, the last thing I'll add Mayor Bagley is that we are working with um, Chief Basher 
in Lafayette to make sure that messaging is getting out. And um, we've been talking about that uh, week in and week out because we have had some challenges with some of the, the, the faith-based churches. Um, and we wanna make sure they understand the importance of this and that they get the message and that they pass that message on to their parishioners. Have we, have we thought about allowing restaurants to reopen with the understanding like one household, 12 feet distancing? Is there anything we could do to allow in-person dining that would allow us to continue to see a downward trend? Has so there I been think discussion that of that? there has been a discussion of that uh, at the state level. Um, my guess is some of you are aware of that. And they were looking at a five-star program that Mesa put forth. The, the state health department is evaluating that program right now. Uh, I can tell you that from what I've seen from the data, what I know will be a challenge is we need to be able to have not only the ability to reduce the disease, but when we bring multiple families together and you're sitting indoors, even if you're at separate tables, um, without really significant separation that makes it difficult for restaurants, you can still have that virus transmit. Because if you think about it, you've got people who take their masks off, they're sitting in stationary places for longer periods of time, um, and it's much easier to transmit the disease. So the latest Yale study, and I'm, and I'm happy to send this to any of you, or you can publish it on your website, looks at some of that specific information relative to restaurants, and that that is a facilitated disease spread um, uh, category because of those kinds of things. And that's what makes it challenging. That's why we've driven and encouraged the restaurants to do is, and I know this is not, I know how difficult this is. And I have to say, I receive calls from restaurants every single week who, who are pleading with me that they can't make it another day. And this is gonna mean life or death for them. And it's their entire investment over their lifetime. So I know what this means. Um, but that we really encourage people to do as much as they can outdoors, much less risk outdoors, 19 to 20 times less risk when you're outdoors than indoors. Those are the safest place, places we can prevent for restaurants to be able to gather. I know that's difficult when we're talking about um, winter time and cold weather. And, and, and last but not least, the one question I have is everybody here knows that when somebody, when I feel attacked, I kind of react strongly. So uh, I have a close friend who was recently fired because her employer uh, refuses to wear masks at the workplace. And uh, she was acquainting with me. And so my question is, when you outwardly have, when you have someone who is not adhering to rules, um, what is the appropriate action to take? So I think the first thing to do is what we've been doing, and this is difficult, right? If we're talking about individual to individual situations, mm -hmm. there's a lot of those things that happen and we're not gonna be able to deal with every single one of those issues. What we're looking for is trends. So as you, I think, as you know, we have an entire business team that's set up around where we're hearing lots of complaints about businesses, people not masking. We're doing tons of education. That's a partnership with all of you and each of other, our other municipalities. The best thing you can do if it's an individual to individual situation is separate from the person. If it's an employer who is not following guidelines, those are the things we definitely want to hear about and we will do follow-ups with um, to there, make sure. There, there, there are, I am aware of employers who are letting people go who vocalize that they, that they need to be compliant with the governor's orders. People are losing their paychecks uh, because they're scared that these people will turn them in. And so uh, I, it's time to start turning them in. As far yeah, as those are things that need to come into the business group in, in Boulder County Health. And then they, they partner with the jurisdictions on this. Okay. Um, you all may have seen it on the, there's several that were um, on the well, newspaper, in the newspaper today where that's yeah, well, I mean, heard and we work with them. Like I said, usually it's like, I know we're all trying to get along, but when people are, people are starting to do stupid, mean things. And so... No, I'll be stupid and mean back. So, um, um, Mayor, I wanted to also on. add. Yeah, go ahead, Harold. I wanted to add something to Jeff in the five point program. We've also asked Jessica, so she's been involved in that conversation because she's partnered. And I forgot the name of the business that's actually de designed a more a more robust certification program. That um, in in their review of it, and Jeff, we need to probably get you tied into this based hey, on what. You. 
Yeah, HQ. And, and so I know they're trying to talk about that a little bit because they think it's a little more robust than what Mesa did. And so I know those conversations have been forwarded to the governor's office as well. Yep, Jessica did send those. Um, so thank you again for partnering Good. with us there too. That did get into the governor's office with the encouragement that they take a look at that program. Good. Um, and then um, Mayor Council, I just wanted you to know that based on what we were seeing in conversations that Jeff and I had in terms of critical infrastructure and all of these issues, um, what we were seeing internally just to know what we did. Um, you know, obviously I've said we're really enforcing masking in those issues. But to the point of this, basically said, if there's not a reason for someone to be within six feet of each other, you don't need to do it. And if they're really the only reason we should be within six feet of each other is if there's an emergency issue that we need to deal with, water leak, wastewater leak, those types of issues. And so we've even been more focused just based on the cases we've seen in our organization in terms of just saying, don't be near each other. Be six feet away. Dr. Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, Jeff, any advice uh, for us or for members of the public on the apps that um, that are available to monitor our own proximity to others who um, either have been infected or where outbreaks have occurred? Absolutely, and I, I can't believe it, but I'm completely spacing the name of the app that you put on your phone that will tell you um, if you've been exposed to somebody um, that is close to you that has COVID. And what it does is it does not collect any personal identifying information. I don't know the technology behind it. Uh, there's, there's a ton of information on the state's website about it. Harold, I hope you're looking it up for me because I can't believe I've spaced the name of it. But um, but there is an app that you can download on your phone. I've downloaded it on mine as soon as I heard about it. What happens is if you get in close contact with somebody who is a probable or known positive, then you get a, a text message that comes to you that provides you with uh, explanations of what you can do as next steps. And the reason that's important, especially now, so thank you for bringing this up, Dr. Waters, is because we know we can't contact trace and do case investigations with everybody. So this is another way for people to get a notification if they've potentially been exposed and is a, a very positive thing. All right, Council Member Christensen and Council, Council Member Doug Faring, and then Council Member Martin. Thanks. Um, Jeff, I, uh, someone wrote in today with what I thought was a good suggestion. And of course, because we won't be getting the vaccine, uh, most of us, for quite some time. So that's very frustrating. But anyway, one thing that we could do in conjunction with this app that you just mentioned is if people get the vaccine, they would be given a little certificate that they can show and then we can let those people go to restaurants and bars to, and be assured that uh, we can begin to open things up as people get vaccinated because their entrance to be able to go to a restaurant or a bar would be their certificate of vaccination. Do you think that's a good idea? Uh, I will definitely float the idea. I think the tracking is going to be the hardest thing to deal with. So if you think about the number of vaccinations that need to go out across all of the communities across Colorado and how we actually coordinate and track all that um, and then make sure that the person who's in the restaurant um, who gives them the certificate, I bet there's a lot of operational issues with that, but I will, I will definitely float the issue and bring it to the state as well and just see if anybody has thought about this or talked about this yet. Thank you. Susie, I'm sorry, Council Member Doggo Faring. You're good. And Council Member oh, Martin. I found it. Council Member so, Peck. COVID19.colorado.gov exposure dash notifications. Um, add your phone is the other um, way that you can access it. I have it on my phone, that's why. Thank you, Susie. You're welcome. Yeah, the key, the, and the key piece on that is when, when you get a test result, if it's positive, there's a 
section in the app where you can upload your result. Um, we had this question on our staff. Um, basically, depending on the age of your phone, it uses a Bluetooth technology in terms of proximity, but it doesn't keep track of, doesn't track you. There are some older phones that does, it does use location services, but it also doesn't track. We sent this information out to our community, we will, or to our organization. I'll have Sandy send it to you with a technical article that goes over that. All right, I'm gonna keep, uh, let's take these last couple comments and then just gonna remind everybody nicely that we still have four huge issues to get through tonight. All right, Councilmember Martin. Yeah, actually it was the same thing. I had found it before Councilmember Christensen spoke um, and it's uh, uh, the other thing people should probably know is that if you have an iPhone, you don't need to install anything. You just have to enable your Bluetooth. Um, and uh, it can be frustrating if you <laughs> if you have an Android phone. <laughs> Harold's going, yeah, it can. Um, but uh, that's what it's called. The, it doesn't really have a catchy name. It's just called exposure notifications. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Um, this goes to Councilwoman Christensen and Jeff Zayak. Um, I just saw in the news that uh, Google and other uh, big platforms are creating an app that once you get the vaccine, you fill in the app and it will give you a green screen that you hold up to go into any uh, any event, any restaurant, et cetera. So that might be more worth looking into. Um, and then nobody has to question anybody. You just hold up your phone that you've had the vaccine. Thank you. Pretty cool. Thank you, I will look into that for sure. All right, Jeff, thank you very much for your continued work. Um, I don't know if you signed up uh, when you first started this job, if you ever thought that you'd be doing this kind of crap. But uh, earning your money, my friend, earning your money. So thanks, thanks for your help. Thanks, right. Mayor. Appreciate it. Thanks, council members. All right. Next, let's go ahead with the front range passenger rail presentation. Joan. And Great. No thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilor Peck. No complaining about the rail. Okay. We're going to talk about it. I know you hate it, but we're going to talk about it. By the way, I'm being sarcastic. I know Council Member. I Peck know is you excited. are. Okay. Hi, Randy. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, members of Council. Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. Just wanted to uh, quickly get to the Front Range Passenger Rail um, presentation here by Randy Grauberger. Uh, this is some pretty positive news for um, passenger rail along the whole Front Range and it also includes a bit of our Northwest Rail corridor. So I invite uh, Randy to take it away. Thank you very much, Randy. All right, thank you, uh, Phil. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I appreciated Phil uh, inviting me quite a while back um, and uh, told him we're always uh, anxious to get the word out about Front Range Passenger Rail. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. Again, I won't have as many bar graphs and, and probably as much interesting uh, information. I was fascinated by uh, all of the good trends that Jeff was talking about tonight and and uh, I just encourage us all, and you do the same, to keep wearing those masks, folks. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. I'm, the, I'm Randy Grauberger, and I am the project director for the commission. I was hired for this position uh, almost two years ago. Uh, now, uh, the commission itself was created by the state legislature in 2017. These are the 11 voting members. Uh, the top ones are the 11 voting members of the commission. Then we have three non-voting members. As you'll see, uh, both railroads, uh, class one railroads in Colorado are members of the commission. DJ Mitchell, uh, BNSF Railway. DJ is actually the vice president of passenger rail operations for the entire BNSF network. So we're extremely fortunate to have uh, DJ uh, on board as one of our voting uh, commissioners. Also, we have representatives from each one of the front range MPOs. Uh, we have uh, a couple individuals in the southern part of the state uh, because half of the commission's charge is to continue to work with Amtrak and the BNSF to make sure that Amtrak's long distance train between Chicago and, and Los Angeles, the Southwest Chief, that that uh, train remains in southeastern Colorado and, and continues to flourish. Uh, Bill Van Meter with RTD 
uh, is another one of the uh, voting members of the commission. We have three non-voting members, David Krutzinger, he's the head of the Division of Transit and Rail at CDOT, Rob Eaton uh, with Amtrak is a non-voting member, and then Dale Steenbergen, uh, one of your neighbors up north in, in Cheyenne, with the Cheyenne Chamber, is also a non-voting member. Next slide, please. Um, these are the commission's purposes for existing. Basically, again, that legislation in 2017 uh, said that the commission should continue to uh, preserve Southwest Chief Service in the southern part of the state. And then the last bullet and the most significant probably to you folks is the facilitation of the development of front range passenger rail. The legislation called for front range passenger rail to exist between Pueblo and Fort Collins, which is about 180. 180 mile corridor by highway. Next slide. Why the renewed interest in passenger rail? I mean, there have been studies done for many, many years up and down the front range and across the state for passenger rail. But the real reason that it really makes sense now is the incredible population changes. As this slide shows, uh, these uh, stacked uh, counties uh, show how much growth there's going to be along the front range uh, over the next, um, between 2018 and 2050. Uh, as you can see, all of the growth, well, not all, but certainly the predominant amount of growth in the, in the state of Colorado over the next 30 years will occur in this 180 mile corridor. Next slide. Here's some of the reasons that the commission was charged with implementing front range passenger rail. Anybody that drives I-25 knows that congestion is simply getting worse. Uh, travel time is increasing and certainly is becoming less predictable. I live up in Johnstown and before COVID, I was commuting to downtown Denver every day, 43 miles uh, each way. Uh, and my travel time was anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half for that 43 mile uh, trip. And, and that's one of the beauties of passenger rail, a well uh, run passenger rail system. You can almost set your watch by uh, when the train arrives and when it arrives at your destination. State's population, we already touched on that, uh, has grown significantly over the last 30 years and it's gonna to continue to grow. Fort Collins to Pueblo currently has 84% of the state's 5.6 million folks. And that corridor itself will gain 84% of the additional 3 million residents uh, by 2050. And just imagine another 3 million residents wanting to use that one additional lane that CDOT is currently adding to I-25. Uh, we don't think that's going to get it done. We're, we're pretty concerned about the, the average travel time, uh, especially if you're not paying the, the toll to be in those managed lanes. Uh, population 65 and over is increasing. Uh, I certainly resemble that remark. And uh, I'm understanding that, you know, the older I get, the less I like to be on I-25. And, and I think a lot of, of, of our uh, older folks are feeling the same way that I do. We had a really interesting conversation with some folks in, in Adams County several months ago now. They had just interviewed a very uh, high powered Fortune 500 company that was considering moving to Adams County. Uh, at the end of the day, they said, nope, we love Front Range of Colorado. We like everything you've got here, except you don't have passenger rail and our employees are used to riding trains and we're going elsewhere. Uh, so we're afraid that that kind of thing might be occurring up and down the front range. And obviously, uh, jobs and economic development are critical. And the younger population, I'll tell you, when I turned 16, it was the rite of passage. I finally got my driver's license. Now you're finding out that some kids aren't even interested in getting their driver's license. They'd rather uh, ride transit and sit on their phone or sit and play with their phone or text their friends or, or listen to their uh, headphones. So... Uh, it's an entirely different world than the old, well, we're out west and, and we all love our cars. That's, that's starting to change pretty rapidly in Colorado. Next slide, please. We did an online public meeting, uh, a survey that was up 24 seven for the entire month of July, this past July. And we, I'm gonna touch here on a few of the questions that we ask in that, in that uh, survey. We had 10,000 people responded to the overall survey uh, which was quite amazing. The consultant team that put this up said they had never seen this kind of response to a, a one month survey. Uh, but as you can see through this pie chart, we ask what are the most important operational considerations to you for a front range passenger rail system? Uh, 
uh, space and location close to my origin and destination. That made a lot of sense, as do these others. Uh, the second at almost 19% was the ability to interconnect with other modes of travel, uh, either currently or planned in the future. Uh, reasonable travel times ranked very high. Affordability of cost was very high. And then the last larger number was uh, shifting people from their cars uh, to reduce congestion. Next slide. One of the uh, other questions was, where would you most want the alignment of front range rail to go? And, and in this particular question, they were only given these three options, downtown Denver, the airport, or Denver Tech Center. Uh, and as you can see, downtown Denver uh, was the obvious choice. A lot of people say, well, there's a lot of people wanting to go to the airport. And I say, yeah, but the people that are wanting to go downtown Denver, a lot of those are commuting and they're going there five days a week. Some of the people that would love to have this train go from Fort Collins or Longmont to the airport, maybe only go out there three or four times a year. Uh, so obviously the downtown Denver uh, focus is, is not surprising in, in this 180 mile corridor. Next slide. And this was an interesting one. What would be your most primary purpose for using front range passenger rail? Recreation leisure, again, was almost twice as high as the second highest, which was commuting. But once again, keep in mind, the commuters are probably on that train five days a week, and the recreation leisure people might be on there two to three times a month. Uh, so the fact that there's twice as many people that voted for that particular recreation leisure column, uh, there still will be a lot more commuters overall on this train, making up the total ridership uh, numbers uh, when this line is and this uh, passenger rail network is opened up. Next slide. This is just a listing of some of the, uh, the uh, again, the people that said, where do you most want to go? And again, there's no surprises. It's the, the predominant uh, destinations and, and attractions, Denver, the airport, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, Boulder, and, and on down the line. Uh, so again, this, this particular question didn't surprise any of us. Next slide. We had done a couple previous surveys back in 2019. Again, this one, the previous one that I just discussed was in, in July of this summer, but these two were done last year. We did a, a MetroQuest survey. This was handing out cards and having people go online and, and complete a survey. Almost 7,000 people responded to this over a two month period. 95% of the respondents believed that passenger rail service could help address the transportation needs up and down this front range corridor and 92% said they'd be interested in using it when it becomes available. Then in October, uh, the Rail Commission um, engaged a couple of the most high-powered political consultant uh, polling companies in the state, one on the Republican side, one on the Democratic side. We didn't want to have this balanced in, or unbalanced in any way. They did 600 telephone surveys across 13 Front Range counties from October 4th to October 8th. Um, in order to participate in the survey, you had to indicate that you were going to be a potential voter in the October, excuse me, in the November 2020 election. This again came up with some incredibly surprising uh, numbers. 81% of the folks contacted uh, indicated that they uh, had support for a front range passenger rail service that would provide regular train service daily between Fort Collins and Pueblo. And we asked the tough question. Uh, none of these others had ever mentioned money. So we ask a question, would you support or oppose a sales tax increase to fund a front range passenger rail service project that would have regularly scheduled service to these population centers with an estimated cost of $5 billion? 61% said they supported it, only 27% said they opposed. The pollsters that did this Magellan and RBI strategies they said they were shocked by these numbers and they said the commission was in an excellent position to begin, uh, begin this project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have done over the past several months, we've been doing uh, ridership modeling and the, the modeling that we've been doing projects that a, there'll be a very notable demand for, for this service. Uh, again, the, the demand appears to be highest amongst commuters and that was significantly uh, aligned with the recent survey we did this past summer, but that substantial demand for recreation and special events. Special events are things like the stock show, like Rockies games, 
um, the State Fair down in Pueblo, uh, CSU and Boulder football games, uh, CU and CSU, Air Force Academy, et cetera. Those are, are special uh, events that are categorized into the, into the travel model. Uh, and again, these numbers that we're coming out with in Colorado, and I've got a couple slides here to show you in a second, but they fare comparably well with um, other rail lines across the country. Uh, and absolutely, the, the trains will create a reduction in emissions and fit nicely into the governor's uh, air quality uh, goals for the state of Colorado. Next slide. This is the, uh, the ridership numbers for one of three alignments that we uh, still have in contention. And one of those happens to run right down through the middle of Longmont, the BNSF line, uh, class one freight line that begins up in, in Fort Collins, comes down to Longmont through Boulder into Denver and all the way into Pueblo. So that continues to be one of, one of our routes. That line is actually 191 miles of, of railroad uh, in the year 2050, there will be 7 million people along that line. We projected out the full vision of this operation and it would be 25 round trip trains a day operating on double track uh, exclusive rail uh, through the corridor with 14 stations between Pueblo uh, and Fort Collins. Annual ridership, nearly 3 million riders per year we're about 9,200 uh, riders on an average weekday. Um, again, we normally um, do model runs with only 10 stations, but this particular one, we used 14 stations, and that included some secondary stations in Fort Carson, Monument, Louisville, and Bertha. And when we do the additional four stations, some people thought by adding that additional station stop time, we might lose ridership. No, the model says we would actually increase ridership by adding those four additional stations. Next slide. This is a listing of some of the other comparable uh, passenger rail systems around the country that we compare uh, this proposed service to. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a service between Chicago and Milwaukee known as the Hiawatha. Uh, they don't even carry a million riders a year and they think that's successful enough that they're currently adding additional trains to that line. The capital line from, uh, from uh, San Francisco out to Sacramento, that's about 168 mile route, uh, carries a little less than the, the projected ridership for this Colorado train. Uh, we've got a, a neighbor to the west of us, the front runner over in Salt Lake City. Uh, that's a very successful train that operates through Salt Lake up to Ogden and, and down to Provo. And again, they're carrying close to 5 million riders on, on that particular service with 28 round trips per day. Next slide. These are the alignments that are still in contention as we're wrapping up this first consultant contract. We've got a couple more consultant uh, teams to be brought on board next year to complete the service development planning and start doing the modeling that would be required by the Federal Railroad Administration uh, and the railroads themselves in order for us to operate passenger trains uh, in the adjacent corridors to the class one freight railroads. So we've got two lines. The, the blue line is the BNSF line that I mentioned that goes through Longmont. Uh, the yellow line is actually the line that we evaluated back in 2014. Uh, I was the project manager for that study for the consultant firm at that time and Phil Greenwald was one of my uh, superstars on the technical advisory, advisory committee for that. But that line started again in Fort Collins, came down to Longmont, and then went out to the I-25 corridor, uh, connecting down to eventually to RTD's North Metro line, which just opened up um, this past September. The purple line uh, is the I-25 corridor alignment. That one does not penetrate downtown Denver, but instead when it hits the North Suburban and and south suburban areas, it heads east out to the airport in the I or the E470 corridor, and then it proceeds south along I-25 all the way to Pueblo. So these are the three uh, that we've been evaluating over the past 15 months, and, and we're anticipating it'll be these three alignments that uh, enter into NEPA. They're all technically feasible. They obviously have different benefits and impacts, uh, but those those particular routes will be studied in much more detail over the next probably the next 15 to 18 months. Next slide. 
Now, this is an exciting slide here. We were, uh, the commission was presented with a, uh, an overview at their August meeting from, from our Amtrak uh, representative on the commission about a new program that Amtrak is including in their federal reauthorization proposal. It's called a network modernization program. And what it will be would be to create a $25 billion, uh, $5 billion a year national program to create new short distance corridors. And by short distance, we're talking about uh, corridors less than 400 miles in length. The Amtrak officials have, have identified the Colorado Front Range Corridor as their top priority in the nation for this new program. And they have already cleared the House of Representatives has, has approved this. They're awaiting companion legislation in the US Senate uh, to, to get this program underway. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you have heard, but the new president-elect Joe Biden is referred to in a lot of circles as Amtrak Joe. So everybody believes that uh, passenger rail is gonna be at the top of his priority list uh, in terms of some of his agenda for the next four years. So that's pretty exciting. But to have Colorado as the number one list on this, uh, this particular program is exciting. Amtrak has indicated they have targeted $2 billion, uh, 2.1 actually billion dollars for infrastructure improvements and rolling stock for three, three trains a day service between Fort Collins and Pueblo. They're proposing a train leave Pueblo and, and Fort Collins uh, in the morning peak, another one over the noon hour, and then another one in the evening peak. So uh, this is exciting and we're pretty, pretty sure that a $2 billion payment from the feds, and that by the way is 100% federal funding. There is no state match required for this new grant program, but we think that'd be a pretty exciting down payment for the future build out of front range passenger rail. Next slide, please. Okay, this is getting close to the wrap up. Again, we think that front range passenger rail has an incredible amount of momentum uh, been developed over the past 15 months. We've got three different surveys showing substantial local support for, uh, for the system up and down the front range, uh, legislative and local elected interest. We've got a lot of folks involved in what we call segment stakeholder coalition meetings. We met four times in, in the past 15 months. The next meeting of these groups will probably be in, in February, uh, but they're basically opportunities for the public to uh, provide a lot of input in terms of alignment, in terms of station locations, in terms of service levels, uh, environmental impacts, all those kinds of things. Uh, Amtrak, is, as I just mentioned, is extremely interested in the Colorado Front Range, as are our Class 1 railroad partners. We meet about every six weeks with BNSF and UP, and now having DJ Mitchell at the table is, is just a real shot in the arm for, uh, for the commission. And other potential partnership opportunities. We're having pretty regular meetings with Bill Van Meter and his staff at RTD. Uh, talking about the potential for the Northwest Rail Corridor from Denver to Boulder to Longmont being the first usable segment of a front range passenger rail build out. And to, to sit down with, with Bill Van Meter and his staff and DJ Mitchell at the same time and, and have those conversations is, is pretty exciting. Um, Bill Van Meter has even indicated that once his new board is seated and, and their new general manager gets her feet on the ground, he is trying to host some type of virtual uh, dinner or happy hour or whatever where his, his board and the rail commission can get together and spend a couple hours getting acquainted and, and, and trying to further these partnerships. Next slide. Oh, that's it. All right, well, I ran through that kind of quickly. I know your first a couple of agenda items tonight were really interesting and, and took a bit of time, so I didn't want to uh, take too much of your time this evening, but I'm certainly available for, uh, for any questions that you might have. Um, I just, I just want to say before we start the questions, just something to keep in mind, me personally, just um, I'm sure you're aware of the RTD Fast Tracks situation from Denver to Longmont. Absolutely. Um, feel free to share with them that it sounds to me like you're, you're talking about a hell of a good matching fund or some type of down payment that would go a long way to us getting Northwest Rail. Um, and uh, you can call, and if they decide to call this one and the same, um, keep in mind that Longmont currently pays uh, four, five, four to $5 million a year to have rail service from Denver mm -hmm. to Longmont. 
And That's so right. that should be money that, that if we're going to continue to pay it, that should go towards rail. And if you and others are going to come in and build that rail, um, I would want to see our tax dollars going to help this project rather than uh, pay RTD, get nothing from RTD, and then have another tax to pay this rail. You know, so the only thing worse than paying for no rail is paying for, you know, uh, no rail twice or uh, yeah. double paying for rail, if that makes sense. So just, just, just as you're talking in these meetings, know that I think I speak for all of council that we want our rail. We, we love hearing what you're saying um, and that RTD needs to contribute funding to this project should indeed it go from Denver to Longmont, which again, speaking for this council, we would really ask that that be pushed. But um, uh, anybody else have anything to say other than that? Because I, I tried to hit it on the head. Councilman Peck. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, Randy, thank you. That was a great presentation. And it's really, really exciting to see these projects moving forward. Um, and so my question is, what can we as a council do to uh, further your interest in using the Northwest Rail over those other two uh, lines that you're looking at? Um, do we need to move faster on getting the Northwest Rail ready as far as uh, getting uh, projects going? Do we need to uh, get a, a, an analysis done? Tell us what we need to do to uh, show that we're ready and that we, we want to be part of this project. Okay. Well, Phil does represent you on the uh, segment coalition, stakeholder coalition meetings that I talked about. Uh, again, we meet about quarterly, every three to four months. Our next meeting, uh, we're expecting to be sometime in February. Uh, that is really where the local support and, and local voices uh, can be heard. Uh, certainly any kind of letter writing campaign, uh, you know, to the commission or to your legislators, uh, we're actually going to be getting out and the commission is going to be sending out uh, pretty much personalized letters. So it'll probably, your letter will probably come from Jacob Rieger, who is, is the staff at Dr. Cog that is, is your commission representative. Uh, but those letters will be going out before the end of the year, basically asking locals to uh, consider uh, contacting if you have lobbyists or, uh, you know, if for the MPOs, they certainly do have lobbyists. I don't know if Longmont does, but these letters will be encouraging you to contact your, your uh, state elected officials. Uh, we expect in this next session that uh, Senator Leroy Garcia, President of the Senate, will once again uh, be running uh, a bill to create a front range passenger rail district. We're pretty sure that uh, when this project eventually goes to the uh, to the voters for funding, we can't imagine that we'll be asking people out on the, the fringes of the state to pay for it. It, it seems logical to follow what some other uh, states and communities have done, and that would be, uh, you know, ask the people that are adjacent to the line and that would more likely use the line the majority of the time probably folks out in Sterling and up in Craig and down in Durango and those in Lamar probably aren't going to get a lot of votes from them. And, and obviously the way we have to do things in Colorado, you need to pass an election to generate some of the revenue. Again, we believe we're going to get a lot of funding from the feds. We've received these two federal planning grants recently and the state of Washington was on this same track several years ago. They're now receiving a lot of federal funding for capital and equipment uh, following the partnership that they created with the Federal Railroad Administration years ago. Um, so uh, we believe there will certainly be some state funding involved, but we know we would like to get all the federal dollars that we can get our hands on uh, for these types of projects. And for this initial $2 billion, 100% federal Amtrak grant that is, is, you know, Amtrak is running around the country giving PowerPoint presentations telling everybody that they're chasing Colorado. Uh, for the first $2 billion of this, and, and that's awfully exciting. I heard from Amtrak's representative on the commission just two days ago uh, that they intend to have uh, the new president and CEO of Amtrak come out and meet with the commission and the governor in February uh, to announce this program. And I said, the sooner you can get out here with that kind of news, 
Uh, I think the Denver Post is looking for some positive headlines instead of everything that's been so negative over the past several months. And so I say, get your butts out here as quick as you can, please. Uh, we need to hear that and the, and the governor needs to hear it. And, and there needs to be a, a very nice press conference announcing that type of, of program for the state. So another question, um, what kind of timeline are you looking at uh, for at least, are you gonna do it in segments or all at once? Um, this project probably works best by doing it in segments and, and using again, the class one railroads. That's how almost every other uh, system around the country, those in the Pacific Northwest, those in Utah, those in New Mexico, those in California, other than the high speed rail, you know, project in California, that's an $80 billion project with a lot of greenfield construction. We just don't envision that taking place. The Colorado Front Range is already so developed that uh, we believe the, the best solution right now uh, moving into NEPA is to suggest partnering with the class ones, starting with six to eight to 10 trains a day, building up ridership over time, building up pots of money over time to, to eventually build out that you know, 24 trains a day, round trips a day on double track, uh, dedicated uh, right away in track, dedicated for the passenger rail services. Okay, and one more question before I let you go. Um, just out of curiosity, is Amtrak looking to uh, kind of evolve in, uh, in, the, in the way uh, the country's going or the other parts of the world and getting away from uh, diesel fueled engines? Uh, is it still going to be the diesel fuel? No. Uh, DJ Mitchell, in fact, is a strong proponent. About every six weeks I hear from DJ, he says, you remind the stakeholders up and down this corridor that by the time, you know, this train is in operation and it's going to take five years, you know, at a minimum to, to see these trains operating under the best scenario, probably five to 10. But DJ is strongly convinced that, that uh, battery powered locomotives will be operating not only the uh, passenger trains around the country, but also their freight trains. And that's very exciting news. Um, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Yep. Thank you very much, Randy. You bet. Thank you. I'm muted, Mr. Cal Council Member Christensen, and then Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, um, Thank you, Randy. This was a wonderful presentation, and it's thank uh, you very much. It it's very exciting to see that Amtrak, which has been kind of more much more interested in its freight for the last decade, is actually excited about this, willing to put money into it, and understands how much this leads to um, prosperity for our region, uh, for mm -hmm. both commuters and tourists. I've traveled all over the world without a car and I've done it on trains and, you know, it's much easier. Um, and uh, so, uh, and it would lead to all, an incredible amount of infrastructure investment and uh, jobs, good jobs. So. Absolutely. Thank you. This is really exciting. Um, I, uh, so I would move that as a council, we draft that um, staff draft a letter in uh, letters to our um, uh, United States senators and representatives and also to our state representatives uh, in support of this in support of this program. Do I have a second? I'll second that. I think I, I think that I think that uh, we should also add on their RTD. Yes. Um, with with uh, outline, outlining some of the concerns I raised previously, um, encouraging the project and asking them to, you know, get behind it. So uh, I agree. You know, all in favor, say aye. Um, aye. I, I, oh. I, can I add something to that? Sure. Go ahead, John. Or sorry, uh, Along Bernard. with uh, RTD, do you think, and I'm not sure, do you think we should add our lobbyists on there as well, who were, will be going to Washington to lobby for us? like commuting solutions, NADA. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I, mean, I, yeah, I, think that, I think that uh, Phil, I think we should just, I think what's best is Phil could just come up with a list and get the letter to him. You know, um, having been to Washington DC several times with Phil and seeing his, you know, 
expertise in action on this particular topic. I have full faith that he'll be able to figure it out. So uh, basically the motion is to uh, write our, our uh, elected representatives at all levels, um, uh, expressing our support of, of the uh, Southwest Chief slash Front Range Rail. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, Mr. Grauberger, thank you so much. That was awesome. Councilmember Martin, I see you. Go ahead. Okay, that was my hesitation about seconding the motion. Is that's, where's my question? Um, Mr. Grauberger, um, you said that there would be a phased implementation. And uh, as you know, Longmont had, has a bad taste in its mouth about phased implementations because we were the last phase. Mm -hmm. um, what criteria do you expect will be used to determine the ordering of which phases will be built uh, at which points? And um, is there anything that uh, uh, a, a municipality can do to uh, improve the odds of being in an early phase? Well, the early modeling numbers that we've done in terms of ridership, the Longmont, Boulder, Denver link is the heaviest ridership in the entire corridor. Uh, the next highest is probably uh, down to Colorado Springs and then from Longmont on up to Fort Collins. Uh, but again, the, um, there are opportunities, I would say, uh, just because of the existing infrastructure uh, that's there uh, from Fort Collins to Longmont to Boulder to Denver. Uh, that it appears would be the simplest piece to add the appropriate sidings to allow six to eight passenger trains today to operate, uh, you know, adjacent to and in with mixed traffic with the, with the class one operation right now. We've also engaged both UP and BNSF in, in some opportunities to uh, consider uh, sort of revising their freight operation uh, norm uh, in the northern part of the state. Uh, if that can truly happen, uh, we can't discuss many details of that yet. I think Phil Greenwald has, has heard a, a few of the, of the possibilities there, and, and we're hoping that there'll be some announcements in the next three months that could literally be game-changing uh, types of things for, uh, for communities in the North Front Range um, through some cooperation with both Class 1. So, uh, we're holding our breath that, that these negotiations continue and, and um, are just kind of, uh, you know, I'm giddy about, you know, what this would actually mean to, uh, to you folks and your neighbors to the north and, and up and down the front range, uh, you know, for not only for passenger rail, but just for the livability of your communities. That's very encouraging news. Thank you, Mr. Grover. Thank you. And again, right. thank you for your, your offer to write these letters. I mean, I, I will let the commission know, you know, about your reaction to this call tonight. And I think that'll put some wind in their sails in terms of these letters. And, and we'll say that Longmont is sort of taking the lead uh, in terms of this advocacy for, for the project. And, and I guarantee you there'll be some other communities wanting to uh, follow suit. So I really appreciate your leadership on this this evening. All right, thank you again, Mr. Grover. Okay, All right. thank you much. All right, how long, uh, well, it's only almost, uh, we might want to take a little bit of a break, uh, depending on how long the update on the 219 Greenhouse Gas Inventory and Climate Action Task Force recommendations is going to take. I assume somebody on staff has um, a, yep. Annie. So, um, Mayor Bagley, members of council, Annie Noble, Environmental Services Manager. Um, I estimate it will take about 20 minutes all right, let's go through that. And it's then. three items, and Lisa will be teeing them up. All right, let's go ahead and do it then. Great. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of Council. I'm Lisa Nabok, Sustainability Program Manager with Public Works and Natural Resources. And tonight we'll be discussing three items with you, uh, all of which are related to climate action. Uh, first of which is the 2019 Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And then we'll be discussing the evaluation and prioritization of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations. And then finally, the Solar Feasibility Study, uh, which was first conceived by wastewater treatment staff to offset peak loading and then was expanded to look at all public, publicly owned properties in Longmont. So I really just want to acknowledge those folks at the wastewater treatment plant uh, for taking that initiative. 
Uh, we'll be seeking direction from Council specifically on the modifications and implementation of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations. And before I hand it off to staff to jump into those presentations, uh, I just want to inform you that we had planned on bringing back the bringing the equitable carbon free transportation roadmap to Council in December. Uh, but that process has taken longer than we anticipated, um, but we do plan to have that finalized and brought back to Council uh, in the first quarter of 2021. So I just wanted to uh, inform you on that. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Francie Jaffe with the sustainability team to get into the greenhouse gas inventory. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, Mayor Bagley, member of City Council and Francie Jaffe, Water Conservation and Sustainability Specialist. I believe I have a presentation um, that should be shared. Thank you. Uh, next. So I'm going to start off my presentation with the update to the 2019 greenhouse gas inventory. Next. As a reminder, the sustainability plan directs city staff to update the inventory every three years from a 2016 baseline. After we completed the 2016 baseline, a target of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 66% by 2030 was established. Um, the city uses the internationally recognized GBC protocol to determine our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the GPC protocol uses the unit metric tons carbon dioxide equivalent. This combines carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxides, three greenhouse gas emissions into one unit. For context, one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent is about 113 gallons of gasoline. Next slide. So over the next couple of slides, I'm going to highlight some key findings, starting with overall 2019 greenhouse gas emissions. And then we actually focused a little bit more in depth on waste for 2019. So then I'll end with diving deeper into our waste analysis. Next. So this is a overview of the 2019 emissions by sector. Our um, largest sector is residential commercial electricity followed by commercial and residential natural gas. Combined, these four categories make up about 79 to 80% of our emissions coming from our buildings. After that, the next la largest sector is on-road transportation, so that includes cars and buses. I do want to note that we have a number of different sectors, agriculture, industrial processes and procedures, oil and gas wells, that are all under 1%. So for the next slide, I'm just going to remove that for, for clarity. Next. So this is the same pie chart, but we're bringing in additional equity share emissions. That additional equity share emissions represents the percentage that the city of Longmont owns of what Platte River Power Authority is selling on the market. Um, this is not usually included in the GPC protocol as um, the energy is being used by other communities, but we wanted to include it as an informational item of both um, the emissions from what is used in the city of Longmont as well as owned that sold to other communities. So in total, with adding this in, uh, emissions from electricity come to about 65%. Although I do want to note that this was done in 2019 and since then we've seen about a 20% increase in renewable energy being, use, being used for our electricity supply. So when we do our next greenhouse gas inventory update in 2022, we should see a more significant decrease in our electricity emissions. Next slide. When comparing 2016 to 2019, we saw a 8% decrease in total emissions and a 12% increase in per capita. This is due for two reasons. Uh, one is activity. We saw increased waste diversion as well as a closure of oil and gas wells. But probably the bigger impact was due to methodology. As you can see on this slide, there's a significant decrease in air travel. This was primarily due to how the Denver airport is allocating emissions to different communities. Uh, doing greenhouse gas inventories are an ever evolving science. So every time we do this, we're going to look for the most accurate and up-to-date information so that we can most accurately present our greenhouse gas emissions for the city. Next. I'm bringing up this slide again because I wanted to, we wanted to talk a little bit more about solid waste. Even though the GPC protocol is a very um, extensive analysis, it does not look at avoided emissions. 
And when you recycle, you actually create avoided emissions. So we wanted to better understand our impact from recycling. I do want to note um, that the analysis was included last week um, as an attachment for Bob Allen's waste services presentation. So we just wanted to revisit that analysis when we did the greenhouse gas um, inventory update this week. Next. So when looking at waste, it's important to look at the full life cycle of a product from a raw material to manufacturing to the transportation it goes through to whether it's recycled, composted, or put in the landfill. So that recycling going back into the manufacturing process can have a huge opportunities for avoiding emission. And then the, the product is either sent to the landfill or composted. When looking at the GPC protocol, it only looks at methane being released um, from the landfill process. So it does not look at this full life cycle analysis. So that's why we thought it was important to use the EPA WARM model to dive a little bit deeper um, into our waste emissions. Next. And what we found was that in 2019, we avoided uh, just under 56,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So we wanted to see the impact of what if we increased our waste diversion. So we looked at two different scenarios. The first scenario um, looked at 85% diversion by 2050. This is equivalent to about removing 41,500 passenger vehicles from the road by that time. The second scenario um, looked at 95% diversion, and this is equivalent uh, to removing just under 44,000 passenger vehicles by 2050. So overall, if you increased waste diversion, we can have a huge impact on our increase in our avoided emissions. Next slide. I'm not going to highlight um, strategies to increase our waste diversion in too much depth, as that was a main um, effort of Bob Allen's Waste Services Update presentation last week. But I did want to bring up the sustainability plan waste strategies to highlight the work that has already been done and has been planned to be done moving forward to increase our waste diversion. Next slide. Uh, before I end, I did want to highlight on this one piece of information that we did find um, when doing this analysis, we found that the city of Longmont only hauls about 33% of the total waste um, for the entire city. So if we want to work toward these waste diversion goals, uh, we need to work with all haulers, not just the city, to achieve those greenhouse gas emission reductions. So um, that is the end of my greenhouse gas inventory update. So I wanted to pause to see if there's any questions before moving on to the Climate Action Task Force. Uh, Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. This is just a quick one and it's more of an explanation. Um, uh, the protocol that Francie referred to um, works really well if you're talking about taxing the carbon emissions. Um, and allocating those taxes. And the reason that um, I think it's important that we pull in the equity share of, of the, um, of the uh, electricity that's generated and sold out of our area, which means somebody else would pay the, the tax. So I just want to say that the greenhouse gases themselves and the other, the particulate emissions and, and the volatile organic compounds that are uh, produced in the generation processes now do not leave the area. And so, especially with respect to particulate, um, we want to reduce that equity share of carbon-based generation as fast as we can, because even though we wouldn't pay a tax on it, we're still breathing it. And uh, I, I thought that Francie's explanation of equity share was, was really important but uh, I'm not sure we put it in concrete enough terms. So I thought I'd just add that in. Thank you. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, Francie, thank you. I think that's a, that was a good presentation. Um, so I, um, I wonder what, your stra what the strategies are for working with the private haulers. I, I think that graph made it very clear that since we only have 33% of the waste diversion and the rest is largely um, uh, private haulers. We need to uh, consider whether we want to, well, consider a strategy for how to work with them and what other cities have done uh, 
in that regard. Do, do we have something like that? Uh, I can jump in on that, um, Council Member Christensen. Um, you'll recall from the presentation last week from uh, Bob Allen, uh, certainly one of the areas that um, uh, we will be returning to uh, Council on is the, the universal uh, recycling and composting ordinance. Right. It is yes. that type of action that um, uh, brings in all of the haulers within the city uh, right. into the, uh, the program. So that is how you would uh, first and foremost start to look at that. So how do, um, when, we, when we bring that back, which I'm, I'm in favor of, but I, I also want it to be fair to the haulers and a commercial thing, commercial enterprises, especially at a time when it's very difficult for them to begin with. But um, could you give us examples of other cities that have done this so that we have a little bit of clout when we're talking about this? Uh, Council Member Christensen, um, yes, that'll be part of the analysis and the evaluation that staff will okay. do. And uh, we'll do some of that work before we uh, return to you. Um, okay with that type of uh, opportunities and options. Yeah. Um, can you also tell me, uh, I believe PACE works with individual businesses to make um, uh, mm, <laughs> to make their uh, recycling and um, composting programs easier to manage. Is that correct? I can I can jump in there. Uh, okay. Uh, council Member Christensen and Mayor Bagley, members of Council. Uh, yes, PACE does offer okay. some rebates and financial support to businesses to get set up with composting and recycling services. Okay. And your question about other strategies that we're doing to support the commercial sector. That's really where um, the sustainable business program comes into play. As yet, we're mostly focusing that on the business side itself, but really helping those businesses to become educated about what recycling and composting resources are out there and get them connected to some of those incentives like what PACE offers um, to, to help increase that, that um, portion of our waste. Okay, that's great because I think a lot of restaurants and grocery stores and things like that that have a tremendous amount of uh, compostable waste um, would be happy to do this, but they uh, they don't have a huge margin, and they have to. It has to be something that they can do quickly and something they can do efficiently. And so, if Pace helps them do that, that's that's wonderful. Thanks. All right, uh, Dr. Waters. Uh, thank you. Can you go back to slide eight? And bring it up. So um, you made the comment that that I, I, I'm looking at total emission reductions from 2016 to 2019. Uh, you made a reference to, or you referred to several uh, factors that would lead to the to the reduction, one of those being oil and gas. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? Is that is that a reflection of, well, just uh, give us more information on what's the reduction of oil and gas that accounts for um, uh, that difference, that reduction? Yeah, um, Council Member Waters, a member of City Council, I would be happy to. Um, in when we did our 2016 greenhouse gas inventory. I believe there were eight open wells within the city. And when we did the 2019, there were only two open wells. Um, when wells are open, they do release uh, methane into the environment. So by closing those wells and going from eight to two, we did see a decrease in emissions um, from that process. Yeah, Rademacher, would you, can you account for that by the, as a result of the agreement we signed, the contract we signed? Councilman Waters, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would go that far at this point. I, I, uh, uh, I understand what you're uh, looking at, but as I look at that particular chart, it appears to me one of the biggest offsets is how we're accounting for our share of the air travel. Um, so um, to 
you know, I, I would re rely on Francie and the work that she's doing to, to analyze that. I, um, you know, the agreement that we did, um, I assume what you're referring to is the one with top and, and, and yeah, Coke. yeah, yeah. That's and, the one I'm uh, referring to. If, right. if we have, what was so say more than about air travel, how does that relate to the closed, eight closed wells? Council Member Waters, I believe what um, Dale was referring to is that even going from eight to two wells, I, I believe our well impact from wells um, was less than um, less than 0.1 percent. So even when it, in from two wells and when it was one eight wells, it was still less than one percent. So that eight percent total reduction that we are getting is probably is not happening because of the, the well closure, it's more due to changes in methodology. And one of the biggest impacts is that the Denver airport has changed how they uh, allocate emissions to different communities. So improving okay. right. methodologies probably had the larger impact than activity in the past three years. Uh, so that, so I okay, guess that affects the question of our total emissions. Uh, how much, what percentage of total emissions do you attribute to oil and gas in 2016 and 2019? Not much, apparently. Uh, not, not much. I don't have 2016 numbers available, um, Council Member Waters. But well, they the, were on the slide. They, they were... The we, we, 2019 were 0.06%, I believe. All right. Thank you. All right, let's go on with the next half of the presentation. Please. Great, thank you, Mayor Bagley and members of council for your questions. Um, the next presentation will be the evaluation of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations, which was requested by city council on August 25th. Next slide. So I know there's a lot of text and I'm not expecting to, you to read all of this, but the reason I'm bringing this all up is because I wanted to remind City Council of the breadth and scope of the 27 Climate Action Task Force recommendations to develop a list of how the recommendations should be implemented. Staff used a criteria and weighting scenario that I will detail over the next couple of slides combined with staff modifications that are detailed in the packet. Next slide. To evaluate the recommendations, staff looked at seven different criteria, criteria ranging from cost to community impact and board feedback. The sustainability team um, developed a series of questions and a way, um, a questions and calculations for each of these criteria and then worked with staff across the different departments to rate each of the recommendations for each of these criteria and develop a final score. Once that final score was developed, the recommendations were applied to seven different weighting scenarios, including a weighting scenario recommended by the Sustainability Advisory Board. Staff specifically focused on weighting scenarios that emphasize greenhouse gas reduction and effectively engaging the community to influence change. Next slide. So I know there's a very colorful image with a lot of small text. The reason I am bringing that up is because I want to walk through how we use the weighting scenario process. So if you look up in the top right co corner, that is three of our seven different weighting scenarios. As you move down the list, the recommendations are ranked as one or highlighted in green to, or to 27 as highlighted in red. I do want to note that this ranking doesn't mean you need to do uh, recommendations ranked one first and then recommendations ranked two, second next and then down the list. Um, this was just a tool combined with staff modifications to help staff determine when the recommendations should be implemented. So when doing this, one of the key things we found is that no matter, for most of the recommendations across the seven different weighting scenarios, they did not shift significantly in how they were ranked. Um, for those that did shift significantly is only for maybe one or two scenarios and not all seven. So this helps staff separate the recommendations into three different categories near term. So the ones highlighted in green, so they should be implemented over the next two years midterm highlighted in yellow the four years after that, 
and then three that should be monitored over time. The last thing I want to highlight on this slide is that those that were highlighted in red, so ranked lower for the different waiting scenarios, staff in initially thought this might mean that they'd be long-term recommendations, but instead we realized that this, this dis indicated a need for more significant staff modifications to determine the implementation timeline. So on the next slide, I'm going to highlight one of our more extensive modifications. Next. So this is for the water conservation recommendation. This recommendation was consistently ranked last across the different weighting scenarios. The Climate Action Task Force called for a 35 to 40% reduction in overall water consumption by 2025. In the proposed staff modification that's detailed in the packet, staff is instead recommending that we continue with current water conservation and drought management efforts which includes a recent um, effort to better integrate water efficiency and land use planning until 2024 for the next water efficiency master plan update. At that time, um, staff should evaluate a more aggressive water co conservation goal and then bring the results to city council to make a decision on how to pursue a, um, a more aggressive water conservation goal at that time. I do want to highlight that, again, this is one of the most extensive modifications and other modifications for recommendations could be as minimal as just adjusting the timeline slightly. Next slide. I wanted to next highlight the 12 proposed near-term recommendations. The ones that are highlighted in yellow at the top are already budgeted for 2021. The next highlighted in red are budgeted for 2021, but may need additional funding um, to meet the goals of the recommendation in future years. The, one, the two that are highlighted in purple, staff applied for Boulder County Sustainability Tax Funding to help initiate these efforts in 2021. Then the two that are unhighlighted still need additional analysis to determine all budget needs. Next. So our request to city council this evening is to approve staff's recommendations of proposed near-term, mid-term, and monitor overtime actions, including the proposed modifications to the recommendations, and direct staff to continue working on these efforts, as well as integrate this work into the next sustainability plan in the vision long run. So um, update. So I'm going to pause at, on this slide to see if there are any questions about this direction or the analysis that I detailed. Thank you. Councilman Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I hope we'll have some other questions, um, but uh, I do want to say that uh, uh, I went over this extensively with Francie and team uh, last week, and I'm really satisfied with the work that they've done. Um, and so I am going to move that the council adopts uh, the plans, uh, the staff's implementation plan for the Climate Action Task Force recommendations uh, as it stands. Second. I really don't know why that keeps happening, but uh, any further objection or debate? Uh, Councilmember Waters? Uh, no objection or debate. I do. I, I, I have a question, but it's not specifically related to the motion. It is related to the just transition committee recommendations. Well, let, we let's, vote, let's vote on this quick and then let's go Very ahead good. and do that. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Councilmember Martin. I know that was important to you. Uh, Dr. Waters? Um, yeah, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to move on to the next topic without having a chance to ask the question. Um, uh, staff brought to us some questions when we saw these recommendations uh, back in the summer. And, um, and we tried to, we got into some discussion that evening. Uh, it didn't go very far. We were asked then to respond in writing to questions. Um, and then we were asked several times, prodded several times uh, to respond to those questions. I, I've never seen what happened to those? We responded. I'm not certain who all responded or what 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 happened to the responses. Um, could we just get some idea of what what that input, where that input went, and what anybody did with it? 
Yeah, go ahead, Annie. I'm sorry. Staff usually just um, jumps in. Council Member Waters, I believe that information was provided in your August 25th packet when we brought that back um, to well, you. Well, Annie, I saw I saw uh, our responses, but I, I didn't have you didn't have to show me my responses back. I know what I submitted, and I had a chance to see that several other council members responded. What, but uh, what? So why were we asked if, if nobody did anything with what we said, or what the okay. input was? Um, Council Member Waters, I think we walked through that whole process in the presentation based on the information that you provided. And I think what we heard from that, we didn't get any feedback, but what we were proposing was to move forward with the Climate Action Task Force um, checklist. And there didn't seem to be any concern about that. And Francie could go into more detail about that checklist, but um, that was the feedback that I believe we got at that meeting. All right, I, that's, I, I don't recall getting the loop, loop getting closed, but that's probably on me. I move that we recognize that that's on Dr. Waters. Do I have a second? No, just kidding. All right, Council Member Peck, or were you seconding my motion? <laughs> okay, Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. <coughs> um, we did do that, uh, and I think maybe the the piece that's that might be left out is is that each of the individual uh, recommendations uh, that Ms. Jaffe showed us, uh, if you got down into the weeds with them, they all contained uh, social equity constraints within the recommendation that are the starting point for what uh, the teams that are going to implement them uh, uh, will take into account. So we would have, and Dale's nodding here. I'm glad, I'm glad we're on the same track, Dale. Um, the, the issue would be is if the, um, the reviewing staff in, in each particular case came up with uh, reasons why they, they could not equitably address these recommendations, then I would expect them to come back to us as some kind of a just transition exception. Um, but so far at, you know, in most of these, the first year there's make more plans. So uh, we can expect uh, uh, maybe to hear about issues with a just transition later next year, but we're, um, we're they're satisfied with their being, that they're being addressed in the separate recommendations now. Council Member Peck. I would just like to thank uh, the whole task force for all the work they've done on this. I know as we go through each segment of all these recommendations, we're going to be hitting on the body of work. So um, everybody that was involved with that, I thank you. All right, thank you very much staff. Annie, good job, we appreciate it. All right, can I have my screen back? All right, let's go on. Let's actually let's take a three minute break before we start the solar feasibility study. Is that okay? All right, be back in, let's let three to five. All right, bye.
bit of trivia as we're waiting. Do you guys know how many calories in a pickle? None. Five. Gherkins or dill? Oh, council member Peck for the win. Zero or 10, depending on the answer, right, Joe? <laughs> Looks like we're all back. So let's go ahead and turn the time over to our staff. Tim, are you up for the solar feasibility study? Yes, I am. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Uh, so good evening, Mayor Bagley and council members. My name is Tim Ellis. I'm the Renewable Energy Strategy Manager in the Energy Strategies and Solutions Group at LPC. I'm here tonight with Dan Shippey, who's a control systems electrician in Public Works and Natural Resources. Uh, and we're gonna present the results of a solar feasibility study that was completed a few months ago. Next slide, please. Oh, we didn't have the slides up. <laughs> Second slide. Here we go, thank you. Uh, so here's our agenda for the presentation. First, we're gonna review the purpose and methodology of the study. Then we're gonna go over the parameters we used for facility selection. And next, we'll give an overview of each of the eight sets, final sites selected. And finally, we're going to cover how the study fits in with the city's plans and goals and what the next steps will be. Next slide, please. Sorry. So as you know, the, the Longmont Sustainability Plan provides a roadmap for social, environmental, and economic progress for the city. This solar feasibility study addresses the plan's actions to expand the use of renewable energy technologies to improve environmental quality, to provide a resilient energy supply and to realize any uh, economic benefits of projects. Uh, this study wasn't intended to be, was not intended to be a community-wide evaluation of commercial or residential opportunities. It was really focused on city and county-owned facilities. Uh, we initially considered 31 sites throughout the city, all but one being city-owned, one was county-owned, and we evaluated the sites with certain selection parameters with the intent of selecting the top eight sites that best align with those parameters. I'll cover the parameters in the next slide. Uh, we then ran the eight sites through our sustainability evaluation system and life cycle cost evaluation tools. And these tools allowed us to rate the sites in comparison to each other regarding the city's sustainability goals and relative life cycle costs of each project. And we have the table showing the results in a couple of slides. Next slide, please. So here are the selection parameters that we use to evaluate the 31 sites and pare down the list to the top eight. Uh, these parameters help us rate projects that would have the lowest cost to build and connect to the grid. And that would also follow the city's environmental and planning goals. Uh, so the, they include how close the solar array would be to existing city electric infrastructure, uh, the project's capability to offset existing electric load, and this is all behind the meter load. Um, also, what are the existing environmental conditions and would the project have any significant environmental impacts? Uh, and are there any future land use, planned future land uses that would preclude the project? And finally, are there any uh, other physical site constraints that would inhibit project construction? Again, this goal, the goal of, of this step was to narrow down that list of 31 to the top eight best suited sites for solar development. Next slide, please. So this table lists the final eight sites ranked by the sustainability and life cycle cost tools as they relate to each other. Uh, the list shows the preliminary estimated cost of each project, the annual energy production in kilowatt hours, and the expected greenhouse reductions for each project. And next, Dan's going to present uh, a, a few slides that are overviews of each of the eight sites that we selected. So please go ahead, Dan. Thanks, Tim. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. As Tim mentioned, there are eight sites that I'll discuss in more detail. Um, they consist of a wide variety of system types as well. It's important to note, however, that the size of the systems in the study were limited to the available buildable area and regulations set forth by Platte River Power and uh, four behind the meter uh, installations, as well as the city's municipal code so that they generate no more than 120% of the previous year's electrical consumption of the service they're serving. The primary reason for sites being highest on the list is due to the solar readiness of the location. An example, 
ease of interconnection and um, the size of the array. There are two potential installations that take place at Centennial Pool. So there'll be one slide that depicts both of those systems. Next slide, please. Um, here we have sites one and two. Site one is the newly constructed renewable natural gas waste services building on South Martin Street. The site consists of uh, a rooftop system that is 240 watt, 241 kilowatts that would completely offset the building's electrical usage. During construction, there was foresight to install extra conduits between the building and the electrical service in anticipation of a potential future solar installation. Site two is the newly constructed maintenance office building at the wastewater treatment plant. This system is designed at 80 kilowatts and would offset roughly 2% of the wastewater treatment plant's electrical load, utilizing available space on both the southern and western roof slopes. Next slide, please. Sites three and four next. Site three is the pavilion at Roosevelt Park and is sized at 87 kilowatts. This has great exposure to the public and will offset roughly um, 64% of the electrical load from the ice rigs, compressor, and lighting. Site five is a rooftop mount system on building seven of Public Works O&M vehicle storage on Airport Road. This system would produce 289 kilowatts and has a great roof for solar that would allow for a complete offset of that uh, entire campus's electrical consumption. The location of interconnection, however, is not directly adjacent to the uh, building where the system would be installed. So it would involve more work to connect to the grid. Next slide, please. Um, here we have sites four and six. Both are located at Centennial Pool. Site four is a ground mount, which is designed at 67 kilowatts and would take the place of the existing solar hot water system, which has been inoperative for years. The existing underground path between the building and the array location can be utilized for electrical conductors and will bring um, operational solar energy back to the pool facility. Um, site six is a parking structure over the parking lot of Centennial Pool. The Centennial Pool parking lot design would incorporate a structure for solar canopies over the parking lot and the design at 240 kilowatts. The combination of these two systems, the ground mount for site four and the covered parking site six will offset roughly 85% of the facility's electrical consumption. Next slide, please. Finally, here we have sites seven and eight. Site seven is the Nelson Flanders water treatment plant four bay body of water that utilizes an innovative technology called flotovoltaics, meaning the array floats. It's an 853 kilowatt installation that would bring, or that would be the second of its kind in Colorado. The solar arrays are installed on floating module racking systems, utilizing water area instead of land. These systems have been installed throughout Europe and Asia and are growing in popularity in the US. The system would completely offset the electrical consumption of the water treatment plant and because of its modular design can be easily added onto in the future. Site eight is a 138 kilowatt design installed over the wastewater treatment plant's primary clarifier covers. It would be the most challenging design as engineering and racking fabrication would be a one-off task. The major benefit of this system is the amount of energy it would offset from the wastewater treatment plant's facility at roughly 6%. Thanks for your time, and I'll hand it back over to Tim where he can talk about the study findings and the next steps. Thanks, Dan. Um, so where does this study fit into the city's goals and plans? Um, and in 2018, the city of Longmont committed to reach 100% renewable energy by 2030. The next year, the city declared a climate emergency with the intent to take actions to address the climate crisis. Uh, this, this solar feasibility study demonstrates the city's commitment to clean energy analysis and planning. Um, and the city now has a list of the eight most viable solar installation sites on city-owned facilities. There are also plans and studies underway by our wholesale provider, Platte River Power Authority, that together with this study will help us determine ways to reach 100% renewable energy. 
Platte River has recently finalized its next integrated resource plan that offers resource options that provide safe, reliable, and cost-effective electricity for its member cities for the next 20, 10 to 20 years. Um, and the plan moves us towards our renewable energy and carbon goals. But even more pertinent to this solar study is a separate study that Platte River is performing um, with the member cities as partners. Um, it's a distributed energy resource study that is analyzing the, the future of these resources in our region, uh, which solar is going to be a very important component. The study will provide us with a model to evaluate DER project cost effectiveness and help us determine which projects and programs make the most sense for the city. We're also exploring various grants and other funding opportunities that can provide financial support to our solar projects in the future. These include grant off grants offered by the American Public Power Association, the Colorado Department of Local Affairs, DOLA, and the U.S. Department of, of Energy. Solar projects, when they're combined with innovative processes or technologies that support both support city goals um, and our grid provide grid flexibility or other energy efficiency opportunities, can qualify for pretty substantial funds to offset city budget spending. Um, one example of these efforts is the city's recent application for a DOLA grant to help help fund upgraded aerators at our wastewater treatment plant. Um, this this uh, grant application also includes the solar project that Dan covered in, as site two earlier in the presentation, and it also pairs it with battery storage at the plant's office building. Uh, we should be finding out the results of this application by early next year. So finally, as these plans and studies and funding opportunities proceed, uh, the solar projects that were analyzed and designed as part of this solar feasibility study are poised to, to quickly ramp up and support achieving our city needs and goals. Next slide, please. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? All right. I, I, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what, I have no idea why my mute keeps not working. But what I, my question is simply, so we get our energy from Platte River. In Platte right. River, this is what they do. They, they build uh, solar, wind, uh, and other power producing uh, infrastructure. Now we are looking at doing it ourselves. My question is why? I understand the symbolic gesture, but theoretically, by being part of the PRPA co-op, aren't they doing it anyway? I mean, Marcia's shaking your head, but I would go this, I would say this as a board of director. I'm sorry, Marcia. <laughs> so my, my, my concern is, my concern is that we are going to be doing something that our power provider is doing, and we're going to be doing it at a more expensive cost and not focusing on those things that we do best. So what is, what is it going to cost us compared to PRPA? Well, uh, you're right. The utilities, large utility scale renewable energy is the cheapest renewable energy right now. But, but the fact remains that there, is, there are many local efforts for renewable energy that are going on as we speak. Um, there is also a, and we are exploring local renewable energy opportunities with, with Platte River. But there are, uh, beyond that, there are, there are opportunities that are, are cost effective, um, depending on what the, the, the um, benefits that they will provide to the city. And that's why we're starting off this process, applying for grants to see how it all works, how it all fits in, how it can be, um, solar can be paired with battery to provide other grid resource flexibility and also accomplish our renewable energy goals uh, so there, there, I think there are multiple reasons to look at local opportunities, as well as the broader um, flat river opportunities, which are usually outside of our local locality. Mm -hmm. um, and another one of which is supporting local business and local installation. Um, so the, I think there are other benefits that are beyond the simple, uh, what is the cost of this solar kilowatt hour that this, this project and other projects like it to, can provide. And I'll let Dale and Dave step in because I'm sure they have Right. some other things to add to that just, just as we go forward i'm going I'm to keep pushing on that because my question is when we say well other people are doing i don't see any math or hard numbers there but uh 
So, I mean, my, again, uh, that question will persist. So Councilmember Christensen. Um, I'm sure Councilman Martin um, <laughs> will have a, a, a better, um, a more articulate answer, but um, there really isn't a, an either or thing going on here. There are a lot of uh, people who have solar installed on their house and they're feeding energy back into our grid. Um, this is part of that. And also there's less uh, energy, I think, lost in transmission because there isn't transmission. It's directly from the building to the building. So uh, there, there's a need for exploring all these possibilities. and. I think this is a wonderful uh, opportunity for us to demonstrate and make our buildings more efficient, especially our public buildings. Um, so I thank you for the presentation and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see that, we've, uh, that we're moving forward to this and that we can encourage other commercial buildings to do this. I remember when I was working at CU, our building, uh, used $150,000 in utilities a year. That was outrageous, <laughs> outrageous. When it had a big flat roof, you know, we just need to be more efficient in every area that we're doing and use the facilities we have. And I think this is a terrific study. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I would like to add to that, and uh, Council Member uh, Christensen made some very good points. Um, first of all, um, uh, Platte River Power Authority is aware that to reach the goals that they are honestly struggling with, that we have set them, that distributed energy resources are necessary by the cities. They have a distributed energy resource task force. Our own David Hornbacker is the chair of the distributed energy resource task force, I do believe. And the immediate good of solarization in Longmont um, is peak shaving. Um, if you can harken back, it was a long time ago now. It really feels like a long time ago. But when we saw a uh, uh, a presentation from PRPA on our electric rates, what we found was that because we have the least predict predictable demand and the, and the highest peak demand of the four cities, that we are paying the highest uh, demand charge component of our wholesale electricity rates. So if the city, um, by offsetting the electric, de the demand uh, for some of our biggest buildings can shave that peak even a little bit. Everybody who pays electric rates can benefit uh, with it. Now, I'm not sure whether, uh, you know, these initial study projects are going to have a huge effect on that, but eventually solarization um, as a distributed energy resource, especially with some behind the substation meter uh, battery storage, is going to be uh, is going to do a real good job of making us a better PRPA customer and getting us more favorable rates. Um, so uh, uh, I I really don't agree that honestly that that this project goes against uh, PRPA's goals in any way at all. They're happy to have us doing this. Okay, so first of all, uh, your comment of Councilor Martin of, I do not agree. I was only asking a question, not making a statement. So there's nothing to agree or disagree with. Well, Second it of, sounded like you thought we were. No, no, no I, I'm asking the question of like, for example, you use the term, it will do or will do a real good job uh, uh, adjectives to describe renewable energy costs, reliability, and, uh, and uh, sustainability, I just want to know numbers. Meaning the organic contract, the contract that was originally signed back by the four cities 10,000 years ago, I don't know how long ago it was signed, but the, uh, the originally we all agreed that we would not do solar power. We all agreed that we would not 
produce our own our own power and we would rely on prpa because it's not going to do us any good to buy our power from somebody else right so what happened is we changed that in order to allow our individual citizens who wanted to provide their own solar um, that they'd be able to do that now the city's doing that right which obviously we i mean at least i think we provide uh, uh, you look at other residences, et cetera, and commercial buildings, we, we, we consume quite a bit of power. We, have, we, we, we do things with our buildings that consume power. I'm just saying before we do that, what that I did not see in the feasibility study is a number, meaning how much, how much is it going to cost us? Meaning compared to purchasing the energy, energy from PRPA and what, what impact will it have on the overall grid if Fort Collins, Estes Park, Loveland, and Longmont all start producing our own power. My only, the question I'm raising is, what type of strain will it create on the system? And as we're working forward with PRPA, I'm not advocating for or against, I'm just saying in the feasibility study, I still don't know how feasible it is, meaning it's technically feasible, but is it, it, what I don't see is our numbers that say, well, we should do it because does it impact the health of PRPA? Does it actually, by doing this, so we can actually do more harm than good towards our overall goal of hitting 100% carbon-free energy by 2030? And how much is it going to cost us? That's all I'm saying. I, I will be the first person to champion this. I'm just saying I, I, I'm just missing a key piece of information. That's it. I don't want to hear words like it'll be good or um, it's, I, I just want a number, meaning how's it going to impact things? And I think that's a good thing to know before we launch into putting a bunch of solar all over town and, and detracting and taking away from our role currently in purchasing power from PRPA. That's it. Well, so the only thing, the only piece of that that I can't answer is the number, which is, is, how long does it take for these stellar installations to pay for themselves in terms of the uh, rate, the, the, the electricity that, they, that we don't pay PRPA for? But theoretically, in terms of the, the grid design, I think it's important to get out there um, that uh, this is something that PRPA expects the cities to do and the PRPA has a task force working on um, in, in how, under, how it should be done. And my understanding is that, that that task force is looking at ways to streamline the process. What this is doing is producing power. I mean, for, for example, I mean, PRPA has solar fields just, just 30 miles to the north and they can produce it the same way we can. And a lot of these, and I'm not seeing like putting, I mean, we're not talking about just putting solar on our buildings. I was showing, I was seeing options of where to build solar, solar plants here in town. And so I understand if we're putting them on our buildings, you know, I'd still have my same concerns, but we're talking about competing with PRPA. And that, and again, the number, the number, I just want, I mean, we don't have it now. I'm just saying moving forward as we're discussing this, I understand that I don't know as much technically about anybody else on the screen here, right? Um, I understand that technologically, I trust you that it's possible to be done. Theoretically, it's possible. I get that. I just want a number. So, but we're not going to get that tonight. So I'm just warning people that I'm going to keep asking for the number. That's it. Unless you have a number, Dale, you're biting your finger. You got a number? I do. All uh, right. Let's hear the number exactly. then. Uh, I, I don't have the number for uh, for the entire issue. I, All I, right, I, get out of here, Dale. No, I'm just kidding, yeah. I, I would invite uh, uh, Director Hornbacher to weigh in. I think he is on that uh, task force working on the distributed energy uh, strategy for Platte River. What I did want to let the council know is um, um, Dan and, and Tim referred to a, a grant application that we put in with uh, DOA. Um, just last week, and a um, few of us were, were part of that uh, presentation. Um, I, I, we've got some initial uh, reaction back uh, from DOLA already. 
I believe we are going to get awarded. Uh, we requested seven hundred and fifty thousand for a one million dollar project that um, involved uh, more efficient blowers as well as the solar array and the battery storage. You know that that's the exact type of project that I believe we need to get involved with to understand battery storage, to understand how to uh, leverage a solar array um, effectively at a site. And so good news is uh, in that particular case, I believe we are gonna get a substantial uh, grant award from, from DOLA. I don't think we've got the formal notice here. I, I'm, I'm getting it through other, other sources, but uh, uh, good news is uh, the number I do have is I think we're gonna get about 675,000 from DOLA and um, towards that million dollar project. All right, uh, Dave, got something to say? Yeah, if I could just add to the conversation and um, I, uh, Mayor Bagley and members of city council, I hear what you're saying there. And certainly as we do, you know, future presentations, make sure we have some of those actual dollar figures in so you can sort of compare it to uh, what is it like versus doing it in bulk up uh, with Platte River at other sites. But I think, you know, sometimes we look at it from two benefits. One, as a consumer, to just offset your use. And how does that compare to the electric bill? But I think uh, a lot of our discussions more is the benefit as a community. How does this really help us? So the solar feasibility study is really a first step in, I would call, preparedness. Um, should grants be available, especially with the next administration, we want to be well positioned. If there are monies available for this type of work, we would have information that we could present and be competitive in that environment. The next, uh, really four elements, so that was the first element. The second element is with our 2030 goal of 100% renewable, one of the challenges is really gonna be that last uh, 10% that we're gonna try and achieve and I'll, because that is the highest variable and the highest cost or can be. And so I think that's where one of our roles as a member of Platte River is that we as a community also look to see what we can do with how we consume energy and how we generate energy to really help get to that 100% energy goal. And one of those strategies is that Distributed Energy Resource Committee, which is currently convened with Platte River and uh, different members of our, our uh, other member uh, communities. And in that, that's looking at the strategies of how these different distributed energy resources can create that environment to get to the 100% renewable mark. And so as we get that information out, we need to educate ourselves further on how we can apply some of those tools. And to Dale's point, bringing in a battery here into one of our facilities is an excellent opportunity to start to see how we can integrate that on a broader scale and then the last point I want to make is electrification. As we start to see more electrification, just the advent of electric cars, and then as we move towards more, you know, home energy uses that are electric versus natural gas fired, that is gonna create an increased demand on an existing electric distribution system. So think of that system as a highway. And you just are now adding a third more population, you know, a half more, maybe you're doubling it. And at some point that that highway gets constrained and you either need to rebuild it or you need to do strategies to reduce pressure. And in the highway system, you're talking about, uh, you know, different types of transportation means and carpooling and buses and the rail that we talked about to really move things around but offload it on the dis electric distribution system, it's really how, how and where can we store energy? How and where can we generate it, even if it's in smaller bits, but in meaningful locations to help reduce the impact to that electric system to be able to deliver. So that's looking a little bit more long-term, uh, but near-term, uh, we do have to look at it through the lens of the uh, cost and benefit. And that's something that also, when we complete the strategy document for distributed energy resources, we'll have more to work off of. And, and I, 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 again, I hear you. 
And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this topic. I have no doubt of that, you know, but still as great as that sounded, Dave, phenomenal. I still still don't hear another. (laughs) Back to the basics. That's all right. I I, I mean, and again, I'm only raising it again because I do not want to spend a lot of time and effort in order. And and then we do something and it detracts from our overall goal. If, if, I mean, because building solar right now at PRPA, as you know, we Mm -hmm. can, we can buy all the solar we want. You know, I mean, but but that's not going to solve our problem or get us to the finish line on our goal. Mm-hmm. So I just don't want to have our city staff do a bunch of. Uh, I don't. I don't want them to do a bunch of you know construction of solar panels, only not to have it make a difference. And mm-hmm. so I'm really asking the question of is it going to make a difference? And so again, we don't have an answer right now, but I would like one as we as we. Uh, continue to talk about this all right any other questions comments or concerns staff what else do you have on this topic all right can we go on to the building energy benchmark update then all right let's go on building energy benchmarking update welcome debbie we see you good evening good evening i'm mayor bagley and members of city council and i'm ready to show a presentation Thank you. All right, my name is Debbie Seidman and I work for Longmont Power and Communications. I'm an engineer and project manager uh, by background. I currently work in the Energy Strategies and Solutions Group. I did introduce building energy benchmarking to City Council back in May, but I am here to provide an update on what we have accomplished in 2030. Um, And I do wanna clarify there's no action today for City Council This presentation is just to provide information and update. Um, Next slide, please. So for the agenda today is I will provide a, um, I'll reintroduce benchmarking. I'll give you information about a demonstration project that we held in 2020 and provide information about a larger voluntary program that we plan to move to in 2021. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, Next uh, click, thank you. So um, again, as a refresher, benchmarking in general is a comparison related to a, or relative to a baseline or an average. Um, In this case, specifically, benchmarking is rating of energy use relative to other buildings in a similar uh, region. Now everyone is familiar with fuel efficiency of vehicles in miles per gallon. So similarly, a building can get an energy score. Here's an example of a building with a score of 71 on a scale of one to 100 where 50 is average greater than 50 is uh, greater than average. Um, And then next click, please. And um, in doing this, we use an EPA software and receive um, an Energy Star score. Uh, The intent is to make building owners aware of their energy use and then to take additional action to improve their score. And this is the adage, the old adage, you can't manage what um, you don't measure. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, Again, as a reminder, um, nationally, there are 34 cities that currently have a building energy benchmarking ordinance. Ordinance, there are also three states that have a requirement. Um, Locally in Colorado, Fort Collins, Denver, and Boulder all have an ordinance. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, So in 2020, we we released and managed a demonstration project with select buildings in the city 20,000 square feet or greater, and these were commercial or industrial buildings. Uh, We recruited buildings to participate in the program. And then um, next slide, or next click. And then um, once we had recruited building owners and property managers to participate, we provided um, some in-depth training, instructions, and um, one-on-one assistance. Um, The program was really designed to help us gain a better understanding of how the software works with the EPA and how useful it is, how beneficial it is to um, both the city and the customers. Next slide, please. So um, we did recruit 10 commercial buildings to participate and a subset of those are shown here. One is the UC Health Longs Peak Hospital. This is a relatively new and large facility in Longmont. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, The school district participated with two buildings. Next slide, please. Um, Honda North America Data Center participated. Next slide, please. 
Circle Graphics, a large manufacturing company, um, participated as well as the First Bank building on North Main. Um, there were also some additional large retail buildings that participated and it, everyone was really a good partner. They were all really good to work with. Uh, next slide, please. So how did we proceed with the demonstration project? Again, we use an EPA software and the building owner is required to self-report their own information. They input information such as building square footage um, and type of building. Is it a school? Is it an office building? Is it a hospital? They also input 12 months of electrical energy and natural gas consumption. And then um, out of that, they receive a score. Again, here's an example of a building receiving a score of 60. And this is again on a scale of one to 100. Um, I also um, like to explain what, what factors affect this score. So that's how efficient your building envelope might be. So how good your windows are, insulation type, uh, ceiling around the windows maybe the number of computers in use in the building. Um, and also I wanna emphasize again, the software itself does not save energy. This is a tool to help you see how your building is doing. Um, you can look at it year over year. And um, the intent is that regardless of what your score is, we would hope that building owners would wanna take action to improve their score. Um, and if building owners wanna do this, um, Longmont Power and Communication has many ways that we can help them understand um, what programs, what projects could be done and how they could get rebates, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. So um, once our building owners and property managers benchmark their building, we did hire a, a third party consultant to look at the input and output and make sure things were being done well. Um, and a an output of this step was that we actually got a little, lot of interaction with our customers and we got a lot of good feedback informally as to um, what they thought was beneficial or maybe what could be done better, better in the future. Uh, next click, please. Um, we also, as I mentioned, had some formal and informal customer feedback. Um, there really was good personal inter interaction um, and customers came away with the importance of wanting to do more. Next slide, please. So here's the results of the 10 um, commercial buildings that participated. And um, again, the building is benchmarked against a building with a similar use. So it's an average for that type of building. Schools are benchmarked against other buildings, office buildings, uh, grocery stores are benchmarked against other grocery stores, um, et cetera. And again, this is in a climate region, so that helps to, weather, I, to, to normalize the weather data and the impact. Um, uh, next slide, please. Now, um, I keep emphasizing this is a tool. The city of Longmont is not, is not really focused on what the score is, only on that a building might wanna make improvements. Regardless, if a building has a score of 75 or greater, they are eligible to become an Energy Star certified building. And um, two of the participants in the program choose, chose to move forward and actually um, are working on certifying their buildings and um, that's a commercial building and one of the schools. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a plus. Some of these buildings plan to continue um, benchmarking their buildings in the future. Also, um, a couple of these uh, large commercial um, and retail companies had benchmarked and then stopped and now they're, they're going to continue doing it again in the future, both with um, some local buildings and other buildings that, that um, other locations. Um, and if you receive an energy starter certification, you receive a sticker, such, so, so it's shown here that you can put in your, your window. Um, next slide, please. So we also um, benchmarked 10 municipal buildings. I worked on those and I worked with facilities management in the city and I worked with uh, many department managers located at various buildings throughout the city to obtain the information I needed to input into the software. Um, I appreciate uh, their help. Uh, next slide, please. So here's results from the municipal buildings. And um, as an example, we have a score of 60 for the Development Services Center. And this was interesting. I, that's an old building. It's actually three buildings that are combined together. Um, and I was surprised considering that's an older building that it had such a good score. I assumed it, it just wouldn't have, uh, I, I just, in general, the newer buildings tend to score higher. Um, but in researching that, I discovered that there was a major effort done, a major project in 2007 to add insulation values to the walls 
and the roofs. And therefore, um, we've seen the benefit of that and that building actually has a relatively good score. Also, I'll show that not all building types can receive a score. However, all, building, all buildings can receive an energy use number shown in the second column. You don't really need to focus on that. Um, and over time, every four years, the EPA does building surveys and adds more building types um, that have a baseline that can be benchmarked against. Um, uh, next slide, please. So what are some benefits to the program? Well, with our voluntary programs that we're doing, the demonstration that I just discussed and a voluntary program that I will introduce, um, with these initial programs, we can provide a lot of really um, good education and support with our customers. And then um, in general, um, benchmarking really can be a good tool um, to help get funding for future projects. And so resulting projects can help building owners save energy and costs. Um, also, um, this can be used to help market your space um, kind of help to promote um, your, um, your performance of your building when you're looking at potential tenants and or employees. Um, I also would like to mention that currently with the pandemic, um, there's, there's probably increased importance on saving costs. So this is another tool that over time we hope can help our building owners. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, as I mentioned in 2021, we'd like to expand this program to all commercial buildings of the same size, 20,000 square foot and greater. We have approximately 280 buildings in Longman of this size. And um, you know why this particular group of buildings? Well, these are our largest buildings. It's a small number of buildings, but a larger impact because these are the buildings that, that are the largest energy consumers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, additional benefits, this supports the City Council resolution for 100% renewable energy by 2030. Cities that have participated in this program have seen a 2.4% savings um, for buildings that have participated, and that's the information coming out of the software. Also, um, this coordinates with other city programs, such as the Climate Action Task Force and Sustainability Plan. Um, also, you just saw results from the Climate Action Task Force and benchmarking is listed on that list of priorities. Uh, next slide, please. So um, current actions and um, near-term actions. Again, we had a demonstration project in 2020. We're still consolidating feedback. Uh, we will move to this voluntary program in 2021. That will include um, expanded customer education and outreach, um, including um, a panel discussion with the Chamber of Commerce with some of our participants that were in the demonstration project. And then we do plan to come back to City Council and report um, our findings from 2021. Next slide. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, uh, Mayor Bagley. Thank you, Debbie. Um, uh, that sounds very good. Thank you very much for that information. We look forward to 2021 and seeing what happens. Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Debbie. This is a really, uh, I think this is also an excellent program because <clears throat> on our utility bill, um, we get a, a, a graph of how much we are spending relative to last year. And that's very helpful because sometimes you notice that, oh, so I'm spending a great deal more on such and such. I wonder if I have a leak, say, in the water system or if, uh, I mean, it just helps you to evaluate how much you're actually spending and do, uh, do some repair or at least schedule plan and budget for repair and upgrades. And uh, that's very useful for, I think, everybody. I, uh, it's not a mandatory program. It's just that I think uh, a lot of businesses would like to be able to save money. And certainly it's important for our city businesses or city buildings to be able to see how um, perhaps inefficient they are and how we can over time make them more efficient and save more energy. So thank you very much. Thank you. If I could add a, an example, you mentioned if you might have a leak, um, an example, not a building in Longmont. This is a large building downtown Denver, but I was told the story of a 
building that did benchmarking and saw they had very high energy use in the summer that they hadn't expected. They have a snowmelt system under their sidewalk and they discovered it had been running in the summer. So, but now you could also discover that looking at utility bills, but, but that's an outlier, but that is a, a positive story coming out of this. And this is also a tool that you can look at year over year. Um, I know myself, um, our August use this year, residential was higher than I'm used to, but we had to shut the windows and turn air conditioning on um, due to the fires, unfortunately. And typically I'm not really an air conditioning user, so. All right, thank you very much. We appreciate thank you. that. All right, all right, uh, we're at the end. Do we uh, have mayor and council comments, anybody? All right, great. I'll start by saying Merry Christmas. We'll meet again before then, but what the heck. All right, Carol, do you have anything? No comments, Mayor Council. All right, you, is Eugene even here? Oh, hi, Eugene. <laughs> Mayor, come on. I don't, I don't know you're here. No comments for you, Mayor. All right, great. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. I'll second. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. All right, great. See you guys next week. We're adjourned.